an excerpt from Dennis Etchison's novelization of Halloween 2. And so it was now, one more rerun on the late, late, very late show on Halloween night in this particular town, acting out the last reels of its relentless stalking of the heart of the American dream. It was always so. Variations of figures like it had come again and again to towns exactly like this all across the country and would continue to come in endless variety and profusion whenever the days grew short and the horror of an unburied past returned to haunt the long night of the human soul. They would come to movie theaters and TV screens over and over in untiring replays for as long as people turned away and pretended it was not really there. That very refusal gave it unopposed entrance to their most inner lives. Nothing ever stopped its coming, and nothing ever would stop it. Not for as long as people deferred the issue of its existence to the realm of fantasy fiction, that elaborate system of popular mythology which provided the essence of its beachhead. For now, it came on and on. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I'm your host, Kieran Madhead. I'm Christian, and today joining me is... Alex. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are uh, both uh, former uh, college... Uh, what would you call it? We went, to, uh, we went to the same college, and that's where we met. And, uh, yeah. yeah, we were classmates. No, we were never in the same class, but we, uh, we hung out in the equipment room a lot. Yeah. And... So we- uh, yeah, eventually, like, soon after you met me, you discovered I was a screenplay collector. Yeah, yeah, because we were talking about it, and then we just kind of shot the shit, and now we're here. <laughs> yeah, and um, today we're going to be talking about Dennis Hutchison's unproduced Halloween 4 script, uh, followed up by a discussion of our rewrite, which we've been uh, in the works of for over a year now. <laughs> <laughs> Long year. Yeah, yeah I'm, well, I'm yeah. facilitating some self-promotion here for these two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, but okay. uh, we were at a party one day, and I think uh, I'm trying to remember if I if you had even read the script yet, Alex. But I I told you about it, and we said like we should do a rewrite of it. And we thought it would be a fairly simple process of like, oh yeah, we're just gonna like clean up the scenes and dialogue. But then like we realized, oh, wouldn't it be more interesting and also better storytelling if if, if we rework the story essentially? Yeah, and then it just became just a much longer process. <laughs> yeah. So we're treating it like if we were actually hired by producers to do a rewrite. So it's, you know, being written with like a lot of thought in mind to what we would do if we had ever been asked to do it back in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, essentially, because it's like we want to treat it with as much care and as much, you know, love for the original uh, draft by Etcherson as possible, but with, uh, with still having our kind of like creative flair to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess we should do a quick uh, – Bruce, do you need to do any uh, promotions at this point? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, um, just for the usual bullshit, if you listen to this show, um, remember to check out our Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter pages, although I'm barely on the Tumblr anymore. Uh, check out – if you like uh, – if you have any questions or comments, shoot them to screenplayarchaeology at outlook.com. And if I don't, if you don't get responded to promptly, it's because Outlook's app is garbage and doesn't always alert me to new messages. So sorry about that. Um, also, we are on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Google Play Music. I've given up on Pandora ever getting back to me. So go check us out on there. Leave an iTunes review if you feel like it, and I'll read it out on the show. Haven't gotten one in a while, but I figure I might as well still say that. And also, if you... uh like this subject matter and want to listen to shows that are similar, check out the Shelf Film Podcast and uh, the Table Reads Podcast where they actually read it out 
in full over several episodes, so you get a bit of a different perspective on this sort of thing. But yeah, that's all the plugging and the usual nonsense. Alrighty. Okay, and uh, we talked at length last time, the first time I was on the show, about Bruce and I's thoughts on the Halloween franchise. Uh, yeah. Alex, let's just get um, a brief overview of your thoughts. How did you discover Halloween? Well, I discovered Halloween, like, really early in my life. Like, at least, like, early in my horror life, because I, I started getting into horror films, like, I think when I was, like, in late middle school, early high school, I think. And I, I remember the first Halloween was on, um, was on, uh, what was it on? I think it was on, like, I, like, uh, AFI, whatever, like, independent film uh, channel oh, that we I had, see. you know? I yeah. See. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I, I can't don't know how I forgot the name, but I remember it was on, and what was nice about it was that it was uncut, so it didn't have any of, like, the weird, like, oh, just chopping editing because, you know, commercial time. It was a full 90-minute movie in full, and I, so I was able to, like, experience it late at night, and at that moment, I can I just kind of, like, fell in love with it, because it, because it had such a, had such a simplicity to it, and such, like, a, such a different tone that I was really used to with horror at that time, because, you know, I, I grew up in the early 2000s, so at that point, horror was so <laughs> really in your fucking face. <laughs> Just like, how edgy are we? You know, so it was cool to actually watch a movie that like took it more subtlety, took more subtlety to it and just was really. It was simple and it and it was effective, you know. And then after that, I watched Halloween two, which I like many Halloween fans love about as much as the original. I know a lot. I know there are some people out there that aren't really fans of Halloween two, think that that goes a little too overboard with the kills and stuff like that. And I could get it, you know, but I never thought of it like that. I I thought of it as a very well made uh, companion piece to one, you know. Yeah. And I, I can watch one and two like back to back any day, honestly. And like even though two is not canon anymore. I don't give a shit. I'll still watch it and I'll still watch it like after I watch the first one any day of the week. Um, hell, I even like Halloween three like because yeah. I, I, yeah, because I respect what they were doing with Halloween three. You know, they, they they finished Michael's story. They wanted to go more the anthology route and had it worked, that would have been interesting because I know after because I know people hated that Halloween three had nothing to do with Michael Myers. Ergo, why? They decided to bring Michael back when they started doing four. Yeah, but... it seems like there's a lot of like infighting now with Halloween fans over what direction the series should have taken like 30 years ago, a decision that they would have had no control over. Right. But like, um, there's the camp that says, no, we just need Michael and that's it. And I don't give a shit about Halloween three. And people who also quote like Joe Bob Briggs on, on that, um, being a mistake. And I'm like, well, there are plenty of like really good things in this world that were mistakes. Come on, you guys. Yeah, there's plenty of things in like the 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 Michael Myers canon that are mistakes. You can't look at Halloween three and just say like, oh, that was a complete bastardization of the series. When you just see all the shit that comes after it, you know. Yeah, and I think for me, I, w I wouldn't have mind if they had done their own Halloween anthology series, but also kept Michael around. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this is before the idea of like a mass franchise like the MCU was being thought of, you know. Right, exactly. especially in horror, you know, this the sort of thing just wasn't thought about, and so the natural conclusion at the time was, let's do something very different. Yeah, and that brings us to you know Halloween Four when they started to bring Michael back. Now I'm a little, I'm a little lost when it came to when uh, uh, John and Deborah decided to leave the franchise, but I oh, know they were, that? but I know they were still a part of it when they started work when they were uh, working with Dennis Etcherson for this draft. I do know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on the actual Halloween 4? Uh, I think we should just get that out of the way. Any other thoughts you have after the series will be summed up pretty quickly, but on Halloween 4, it's it's one of my personal favorites in the series as well. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I enjoy Halloween 4 a lot. I remember when I first watched it, I didn't really like it that much, but then rewatching it again, I grew more of an appreciation for it, you know? And th there's a lot of things in there that's still, like, that don't, don't, they don't really copy John Carpenter's style, you know? Because I know, like, one, two, and three, you know, they definitely, like, kept within, like, the style of John Carpenter's... Oh, it's the same kind of, crew. Yeah, the same crew. But it's, like, I, it, it was cool seeing what, what, it, what it was like with a different crew taking over and adding their new spin to Halloween. And was still keeping within the same kind of, uh, kind of, I guess, melancholy tone of the other Halloween movies and still... and ensuing, like, new lore to it that I thought... that I still thought worked. Like, I people hate 
hate that Michael is like related to like Jamie and Laurie and stuff like that. Me, I thought it was actually a fairly interesting story story point, and I felt like they did a very well job integrating it into the Halloween four that we have. And plus, you know, Daniel Harris is fantastic in it. You know, one of the few child stars I think that are actually doesn't get a lot of credit. I feel like she should get a lot more credit than, than she gets because oh, yeah. she's fantastic in that movie. Yeah, even in Halloween five, she does an amazing job with like an incomplete script. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's like the Halloween four we got, I was, I was satisfied with um, wholeheartedly. Yeah. I, 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 I'm disappointed that they didn't like go with the plot of, of Jamie kind of going in, kind of going towards the Michael route. I thought that would have been an interesting tone to go about, but you know, Halloween five had a muddled production. So <laughs> what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> and well, and then, uh, with Halloween six, um, uh, there's a lot of really good ideas and even in the producer's cut, but like having looked through the original draft, if they had just done some tightening, I think they would have had a much finer shoot yeah, process. Exactly. Um, and we could discuss whether at another time whether or not they should have even had Dr. Loomis in Halloween 6, even though he gives some of his best lines in that movie, in my opinion. Yeah. Perhaps for the sake, the sake of the series, they should have retired the character in 5. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, but nobody knew what was going to happen to Donald at that point. Yeah, exactly. And, like, speaking of Donald, I think he's I'm, – I'm glad he stuck around for 4, 5, and 6, you know, because it's like – like, mm-hmm. that rivalry between him and Michael Myers is like, is, like, one of the – things that make the series in my eyes. So it, it was great seeing him come back for four too. Cause Donald Pleasance is just masterclass actor. Like you can give him a crummy script and he will like act the hell out of it. <laughs> Except like, maybe like Puma man. Yeah. <laughs> he still acted the hell out of Puma man. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. yeah. He treated it like he was still playing Blofeld. Yeah. Um, I think that's what also makes him such an effective Dr. Loomis having played other characters who are very dark. And they're, same with Malcolm McDowell having played Dr. Loomis. Uh, actors who have played very dark roles are, are very suited for a character like Dr. Loomis. Exactly. But yeah, that's basically all I have to say about the Halloween 4 we got. It's been years since I watched it. I, I need to rewatch it again, but, but I, but I know I look on it very fondly and I could pop it in right now and still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's oh, one of my top here. five in the series, I would say. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I quite enjoy it, too. I mean, once you get past that really stupid exposition security guard at the beginning, it, it gets much better. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and originally there was an explanation as to how Dr. Loomis survived the, the blast in the hospital, but they never filmed that, that scene. Yeah. yeah. He, he got he got thrown out a door that wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's whatever. I, I can handle it. But yeah. Dwight Little wanted to open it up with Halloween the season and not Halloween the series. Yeah. And also that just sort of costs a lot to shoot. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, like this script would have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, for our rewrite, we envision like a Spielberg budget, considering that they wanted Dante to direct. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, let's get into it. Uh, so after Halloween 3... Um, John and Deborah were still involved with the series, and uh, Halloween 3 wasn't the box office failure that some make it out to be. It just that in terms of return on investment, it was the lowest to that point, especially compared to Halloween 2 and Halloween 3. There was a huge drop off in box office, but they still made their money back because it's a low budget movie. Right. Uh, it's just that th- the decision was okay, we tried your little anthology idea. That's that was cute. We need to bring Michael back. Um, especially now with Jason and Freddy coming around the corner and slasher movies still being a viable thing in the 80s. And uh, Edgerson had previous history with John and Deborah. He um, uh, was brought in to novelize The Fog on a short notice, and then he uh, would novelize Halloween 2 and 3. Uh, the first film's novelization was written by Richard Curtis, who used Curtis Richards. Yeah, and then in this case... Edgerson used the pen name of Jack Martin, which is also a recurring character of his in various stories. So uh, what happened was uh, he had uh, turned in a few drafts, and Mustafa didn't really care for them. Do I think due to their experimental a their experimental nature, and then b uh, some of the vagueness that I think we'll get into later, and why a more simplistic script explains why Halloween Four, the final film, is so simplistic in its approach. Yeah. And, uh, and that paid off for him. Uh, it was like, you know, number one for two weeks in the nation. And so, uh, but in this case, due to him not wanting Etchison's script, Carpenter, uh, and Hill, uh, formally left the series. And, but we're always in talks to like possibly return after that. 
Yeah. Which eventually John did. <laughs> yeah. But there were a lot of close calls where he almost did. Yeah. yeah. He, they tried to get him for H2O, if I'm not mistaken. Well, and with, uh, yeah, with Halloween 6 as well, there was a bidding war between uh, New Line and Miramax, and John had sided with New Line while Mustafa slid up to the Weinstein brothers, and Miramax won the bidding war. Oh. <laughs> yeah, wonder how that worked out for him. <laughs> Harvey well, I mean, didn't have was the most profitable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so, uh, uh, at, uh, the, we first heard about the script probably, uh, in the uh, Halloween 25 Years of Terror documentary. I remember hearing about it when I was 11 in that documentary. Where, you know, he had written the script and, uh, Deborah had called him one day saying, uh, John and I have sold our interest in the Halloween franchise and unfortunately your script was not part of the deal. That's got to be quite a blow, honestly. Like, I feel for Edgerson in that. Like, you just, because it's like when I read that interview with him with Blumhouse where he was talking about working on it, it seemed like he was really into it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I always thought that he was a novelist first and a uh, screenwriter second. And, well, he's yeah. known for his um, novels and short stories. Uh, looking him up here on uh, Wikipedia, it turns out he did go to UCLA uh, for film studies. Right. And uh, he was the film historian and consultant on Stephen King's Dance Macabre. Oh, uh, he, that's interesting. And uh, he had written uh, a screenplay for The Mist back in the 80s. And while it didn't get produced um, as a film, it was adapted into a radio play. Nice. I and, have heard uh, that radio play, I think. Yeah, it's a good radio play. And uh, they do list on uh, Wikipedia some of the other stuff they had written over the years, and it's a shame that we haven't been able to find them. And it's also a greater shame that, unfortunately, Dennis is uh, no longer with us. Yeah, that was that was quite a blow, honestly. Like I, I remember like I I was at work, and then I saw that I saw that on his Facebook, and I was like, oh god damn it. Yeah, I, w I was looking forward to uh, meeting him someday because he would uh, in Burbank, uh, he would host public birthday parties. I think. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I would have loved to have met him because it's like, I feel like, I mean, say what you will about his, him as a screenwriter, you know, but I feel like there's a, there's a lot to his writing that is admirable, I feel. And I feel like he was incredibly talented. So it was, it sucked to see such a talent go, but you know, you know, that's, that's life. <laughs> you know, yeah, I was planning on writing to him about this and, uh, I mean, unfortunately, that chance uh, passed us by, but uh, we're still soldiering on through this rewrite, but I would have loved to have had his input on it. Yeah, same. But, you know, like, I guess, for lack of a better term, shit happens. But I, I feel like there's, like, a part of me that feels like he would have been supportive of it anyway, you know, because it's like, he seemed very humble around his fans, I think, from what I've gathered. Well, yeah, I mean, hosting public birthday parties, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can't get more humble than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and unfortunately, his, uh, his wife had to put up a GoFundMe page for his funeral, but one of the people, and, and thankfully got funded fully, yes. and one of the, the biggest donor, I think, was Neil Gaiman, who, like, donated a thousand bucks. Oh, nice. I didn't know Gaiman was a fan of his. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. But. Yeah, neither do, doesn't surprise me either. Nothing but, surprises like, me. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. No. Uh, but, you yeah, know, uh, we should um, – uh, is there any more production history? I know that uh, we have a huge Halloween document of production history behind all these projects, and there were various interviews with Carpenter before and after he left the franchise talking about the script briefly. The one um, thing I know that we haven't brought up yet was that apparently, like, Canon was in talks to to help finance this. I, I don't know how much truth there is to that. I mean, granted, we don't have a paper trail to prove yeah. it. Well, I mean, they were starting to get into horror with, like, you know, I mean, they started with a lot of horror films, but, like, you know, they had most recently, like, you know, produced, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. That's what I was about to say. So I was like, that that's actually kind of interesting. I, I, I don't know how the hell this script would have turned out. It had Ken and produced it. Like, the... They would yeah, not have I had think, the money yeah. to do the climax. <laughs> yeah, I think it needed, uh, considering... Um, the director that they had approached to direct this was Joe Dante because he had uh, been previously – he was the original director for Halloween 3, which is how he got Nigel Neal involved um, in writing Halloween 3 initially, and but then left to do Gremlins uh, or, like, left due to, like, schedule conflicts. And uh, I, I think uh, the rewrite, uh, we wanted to infuse more of, like, Dante's styles of directions to it. Uh, we'll get into that later, but um, – 
uh, it needed like a Spielberg budget, in my opinion. It definitely did. Like that climax, like like Bruce has said, is very very bombastic. But like even beyond that, like I feel like there is like some of there's so many characters in this freaking script. Like I remember when I was first reading it, I was just like, Jesus Christ, how many people are getting introduced in this thing? Like it. Yeah, yeah. There's one it's... character. There's one character in particular who I swear disappears for like 50 pages. Oh yeah, Mrs. That? Wallace. I was thinking the Leah. Mrs. Wallace. Oh, there are a lot of characters who kind of like came in and out of this. Yeah, I know. Like, I know that was like a big thing with my like Mrs. Wallace. Like, she has like the big opening dream sequence, and then she's just not in the script through most of it. And I'm just like, where did the, what the hell happened there? <laughs> uh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, here. Hold on a sec. I, I think. Um, okay, now I got, I got it back. Uh, it's it, it kind of reminds me of John Carpenter's The Fog actually. Yeah, it does have very fog vibes to it. <laughs> uh, especially near the ending where they out overtly just play the fog. Um, yeah. But like in terms of like uh, structure and pacing, um, if you all like watch the fog, like, it's following a lot of characters in that small town all right. in one day. Which I will admit, like even though there are a lot of characters and like budget wise, I'm like, I have no idea how the hell they would have pulled this off, especially for a slasher. I felt like it was an interesting way to go about it because really like the thing I appreciate the most about this script is that it's not it it's not following a character per se, it's following Haddonfield as a whole. And I thought that really gave life to the town, I felt. It does, yeah. but I, I think at the end of the day you, you need to sort of pick a character and have this story presented uh through their lens. Yeah. You can still have the oddness of the town presented, but it needs to be presented, I think, with a central focus. More yeah. of a central focus. Because it, yeah. it's it's sort of Lindsay in places. It's sort of Tommy at others. It's sort of, and it's Mrs. Wallace in the beginning, and then it's for a while Deputy Hunt, and then it's yeah. uh, it's Robert Mundy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reporter from Halloween too. Yeah. But also, he's not even a deputy anymore. Hunt is now a detective. <laughs> or maybe that is a title given to even deputies. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm not a cop, so no, neither am I. Yeah. I don't know anything about people in the police force, and I really... Come on, Alex, we all know you're secretly a narc here. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm just, you can't blow my cover like that, Christian. I'm, I'm going to have to oh, take shit. in. Sorry, yeah, sorry. You're, you're, you're sniffing out that, that, that dank script connection. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> well, like, some shit in this, you had to have smoked some grass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there any other history you need to go into here, Bruce? Uh, not that I know of, because, I mean, I just... I just pulled up the document, and we basically got everything. Oh, uh, how about your connection to all this? Because you're the one who bought oh, it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I um, when this okay, first... so should we uh, should we uh, frame it here? Just give it a proper framing. Oh, the the plot? No, no, no. Uh, about the interview with Hutchison. Oh yeah, yeah. Just talk about the interview quickly. Yeah. So in uh, 2016, uh, for years for me, this was all a, a unicorn of a script, and. Um, it seemed like we would never find it, but I guess I never considered just straight up asking Edgerson. But in 2016, he gave an interview with Blumhouse about the script and eventually put up the script for uh, two of his drafts for sale on eBay. And who bought it but else? Me. <laughs> yeah, you were uh, the local hero on our uh, message board that day, the message board that's no longer around, sadly, unfortunately. Sadly, sadly. Yeah, yeah. It, it was um it was the second and third draft and a um and uh, one of the McElroy drafts of four, uh, which uh, you can already find on the internet. But I, it was Edgerson's personal copy that had been given to him due to a script arbitration. Ah, nice. So, um, but yeah, you uh, uh, I was one of the first people that you also gave a scan of this too. Yeah. And you see, I got into this late in the game. Christian just told me about the script, and I was like, wait, this exists. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was so out of the loop with that. But, like, but, but no, I I spent um, an obscene amount of money on this. We won't go into figures. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, and so basically, yeah, this is one of the. Uh, th there's only like a handful of more of these sort of like big Halloween scripts that haven't really come to light yet. Like, we still don't have the original draft of Halloween three, the the original draft of five, and I think like there's like a couple of things from later on. Yeah, it's mostly uh, like 90s and 2000s where it gets a little more muddled due to the fact that now it was a studio series. They're, they were constantly going to screenwriters for a script. Right. Yeah, and like the the big, big one from later on, I know we don't have is The Lost Years. 
Yeah, which is sort of a gap, it, which is the bridge between the idea of Halloween 9 taking place in an asylum and then doing a prequel that focuses on young Michael to then having a remake where the first half focuses on young Michael. God, Weinstein was obsessed with that asylum setting. Oh, yeah. Also, <laughs> apparently the whole execution plot that showed up more than once, there was one or other of the Weinsteins who insisted on it. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> so... So how, uh, we'll be mainly covering the second draft, uh, but we'll point out what the differences are between the uh, third, uh, between this and the second uh, and the third draft. We'll start. Uh, the one improvement that I think uh, the third draft makes over the second draft is the opening scene. Yes, and I guess I'll go to my notes now. Yep. Okay, so we start off, and it's we're seeing a, um, a POV shot of a mirror. And there's a shadowy figure dressing itself, and it says it's dressing for Halloween. And oh, oh wait, I also want to mention before we go into that that it that it uses the the Roman numeral four, keeping in in theme with the previous Halloween sequel. Yeah, which is how I title this whenever I'm writing it, uh, yeah. just to uh, keep that in the real Halloween four out of my head. Yeah, exactly. But, but no, he's uh, but so this figure is dressing itself for Halloween, as it says, and then it pulls on the white featureless mask, and it says it is the shape. Yeah. And in the uh, third draft, uh, it's a recreation of the first film's opening, um, where Michael heads into his house and walks into Judith's room where there's a mirror place and he puts on the mask, which I, I think is more effective. Yeah, so I liked I. it a little, I, I liked it a little bit more. And the fact that it also mirrors it a little bit in detail where he actually looks over at the bed. Yeah. 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 Uh, we believe that was probably a suggestion by John Carpenter because Edgerson said in his third draft, uh, for his third draft, he it was at Carpenter's house around Christmas time, and they were looking through the second draft in John's living room, like sitting in front of the fireplace. And John would like make notes and like cross out lines and say, "Okay, well, you don't need to have this line here because the shot tells the whole thing." And so I, I'd say this is probably Carpenter's contribution to the third draft. Yeah, and plus I just love the the, the tone it sets because it really kind of gives you the the audience the vibe like Michael's back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which I thought was like such a such a cool um, visual to do by having him come back with the same visual of how we were introduced to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even though it doesn't necessarily add anything to the plot per se, it is a great opening. And plus, I have a feeling the opening credits would have played over it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, we have an interesting idea for the pumpkin opening for ours, but we'll get into that later. Um, and then, uh, so then we shift to, uh, the title card and date saying Hattonfield, October 31st. And it's at another house, uh, where Mrs., uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, uh, will walk out of a party after it's done and talk about having to get home to Lindsay. And then, uh, they get caught in a traffic jam and then, uh. Which is an event that's referenced in Halloween too. Yeah, uh-huh. which I thought. So they get caught in a traffic jam, and then Mrs. Wallace runs over, and she sees that the house that the crime is at is at their house. <laughs> and I'm just imagining her just shoving Dana Carvey out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't even need to be justified to push Dana Carvey out of the way. <laughs> the Turtle Club? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just like, am I not turtly enough for the Turtle Club? Out of my way! That's my goddamn house! <laughs> But, but no, she uh, she run she runs up to the door and she hears Lindsay crying from behind it and she's trying to get it open but it's locked or stuck and then she turns around to get help and everyone has disappeared. Yeah. Which uh, this is an effective nightmare sequence in my opinion. The fact that it goes for full surrealism here. Yeah. Oh yeah, and so she goes and she goes to hit the door again and it just turns into like doughy. It's like a doughy texture and she falls into the house and it shuts behind her. Oh my god. And then, like, inside, like, I remember, like, all the houses just distorted, and then Michael bursts out of, like, of her Lindsay. daughter. Yeah. Like, the house is alive, essentially. Yeah, basically what happens is that the whole, everything, like, all the furniture, everything is dripping blood, and then and she sees Lindsay standing on the stairs now not making any noise, and she's in silhouette, and they say that, like, the house's interior it becomes fleshy and bloody like the inside of a living organism. And Lindsay raises a hand with the knife in it, and she breaks open, revealing the shape. But I'm not sure how you would shoot this in 1986. 87 in this 87, case. 87, yeah. 
But I, well, I mean, I was thinking the date on the script, but yeah, it would have been in '87. Yeah, and uh, this is like the one. Uh, this and the ending are like the two big like Dante isms, if there are any in this. Yeah, this is very Dante isk. Yeah, and so the shape it just starts running, going at it with the knife, trying to stab her, and it misses, and it's like hitting the furniture. It's making the furniture bleed, and then it cuts to the outside of the house where. The house now looks like a face with jack-o'-lanterns in the upstairs windows like the eyes. And then blood flows out from under the front door, and the angle goes wider, and it shows that all the houses on the street look like these faces now, and the street is a river of blood. And then the shaped shadow is cast on the river of blood as a scream is heard, and that's when Mrs. Wallace wakes up from her dream. And apparently she says this is a dream she's had every Halloween ever since. Yeah. And the date's revealed to be uh, October 31st, 1987. Now, one thing I looked up here that um, is that that actually falls on a Saturday, and yet we have characters going to school in this. Uh-oh. I know. Hey, the 80s were a crazy time. Yeah. Well, I mean, apparently the actual um, Halloween 1978 in Illinois was apparently, like, snowy, so... Well, that doesn't matter, but, like, to me, like, if you have it falling on a weekend, then don't have kids going. If you're saying what the year is, then don't. <laughs> Think about, like, would kids actually be going to school? I know it's a minor complaint, but still. It's in Haddonfield. They make you go to school on Saturdays because they're crazy in this script. <laughs> maybe if they had that, it, maybe if they maybe if they had said that, then I would have bought it. But, yeah. But they never did. Never got that chance. Nope. Oh, well. Then we cut to Lindsay in her room, and her father tries talking to her about going to the homecoming dance. Yeah, I remember that. And then isn't it around this time when uh, Tommy calls the Wallaces and tries to talk to Lindsay? I yeah, believe? it's like it's like right after that conversation. And then like he co- and then we get our introduction to Tommy, and I remember that. In the end, like, after Mrs. Wallace, like, gets the phone and is just like, you cannot talk to my daughter, essentially, straight up calls her a bitch after he gets the dial tone. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, in the second draft, her. yeah, in the second draft that occurs, they eliminate the bitch line in the third draft. Yeah, in the second draft, like, after she hangs up, he sits in his room for, like, a solid page talking to himself and going, like, blah, 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 and then he goes, you'll figure it out too, bitch, but not until it's too late. And I'm like, okay, Pinkman, calm down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do like. I do kind of like the more moodiness to the scene in the third draft, just because I like how it kind of it sets more of a mood, and you don't really need a lot of dialogue for it. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, he could have just as easily just went bitch. <laughs> just... Also, the uh, the way Tommy is portrayed here, I think, actually has like some interesting, probably unintentional kind of parallels with Tommy in Halloween Six, because he is the uh, the weird guy across the street with like all kinds of crazy shit in his room. Yeah, we've speculated as to whether or not Ferens read this script, because also in that script, although it was an idea that had been uh, tossed around for a while, was that Halloween was starting, uh, that Haddonfield was starting to celebrate Halloween again. So that was around before Ferens wrote Halloween 6. But we wonder if he somehow got his hands on the script at a like, convention or something, uh, just due to some of the similarities. There are a lot of similarities between this Tommy and Tommy and Halloween 6. Like, I remember when I was reading it, I just, I could not help but picture Paul Rudd. <laughs> they yeah. think he's even weirder than Paul Rudd's Tommy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so after Tommy, we uh, cut to uh, Detective Hunt in his bedroom. Yeah. Uh, waking, uh, trying to wake up, uh, being, you know, forced to go into work, essentially, by Brackett. A uh, quick note is that in the third draft, they replaced Sheriff Brackett with Sheriff Hamilton. Effectively fills the same role, but uh, ultimately does is not that much of a different character. They don't really do much other than that. In the second draft, they point out the connection between Brackett and Annie and whatnot, you know. Yeah, if I remember in the third draft, because it's been a while since I read it, like, the role is almost exactly the same except for that line. Yeah, a few of the lines are just changed so that, you know, hey, new sheriff, you know. And I find it interesting that they were thinking about bringing him back for this, and that but then came, stopped it. Yeah, then they, that came back around in Halloween Nine because both those Halloween Nine scripts have Bracket in it to some extent. Mm-hmm. And then I know, then I know at that point um, when he gets called into work, uh, the sheriff has to go deal with a group of anti-Halloween moms by assuring them that Halloween will not be celebrated in Halloween because at this point, because Hattonfield. Haddonfield. Why did I? I, I don't know. What Halloween won't be celebrated in Halloween. <laughs> Halloween won't be celebrated in Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween is canceling itself, guys. 
Yeah. Fortunately, I don't think Bill O'Reilly will complain about this on Fox News. Uh. <laughs> The war on Halloween. <laughs> the war on Halloween. War on Fox News at nine. <laughs> no, he'll just yeah. write. A, he'll just write a book called "Killing Halloween." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but yeah, we get that scene, and that's where uh, that's where Bracket is like tells one. Of, he tells one of the uh, the women there. He says, "Are you a mother?" And she goes, "No." He goes, "Yeah." Well, I had a kid, and she was the ones who died. Remember that? Which is a good moment. Yeah, and also one of the mothers is Mrs. Doyle. Yeah, who she <laughs> crops up here and there. Yeah. yeah, not much is really done with her and Tommy, though, in this. Yeah, but um, after that scene, we go back to Hunt, and he's about to take his thirty-eight, and then he decides to uh, take his forty-four when he hears some kids walking down the street singing No More Days Till Halloween. So, Silver Shamrock reference, I guess? Yeah. Not a bad one, if that. <laughs> and then, uh, so Lindsay is off to school, and she tries talking to a girl named Aliyah. But Mrs. Wallace insists on driving her to school. She's being really crazy. <laughs> yeah, really kind of nuts in this. That's why I was kind of disappointed we didn't really focus on her that much, is because it was like she's just kind of like they really lay in like trauma with this with her character, but they just never like focus on it that much. <laughs> she's just just like crazy mom, and then just disappears. Not yeah, no, not there's no full character arc for her, which maybe it should there should be one for her. In this yeah. type of story. Like, even just giving her a little bit more at the ending would, would tie that off of a, a bit better. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, you don't need her in it a lot. You just need a little bit just to kind of make it feel like, oh, she's, like, in the story. Because it's like, my God, she just vanishes. Yeah. Well, well maybe she's not that upset. Maybe she's perfectly fine. And, and it's not so much the killings that have her upset as the fact that she had to clean up the sheets after Bob and Linda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get rid of the blood and cum. It's like, yeah, I can't have a backlight party in here anymore. Do you know how much that, you know how irritating that is, Lindsay? I'm sorry, God! Did you know Bob wanted to strip you down, Lindsay? Did you know that? I always laugh because I always thought that was like a flub that they made on set, but then looking at the script that's actually in the script. <laughs> oh my God. Like, no, I remember that, and I was like, holy shit, that's in the script. That wouldn't have been made today, that one. <laughs> yeah. Does Halloween have a pedophilia agenda? Oh, Oh, you know, there'd be like those endless articles written about it now if that if they were to see that scene. Yeah. Yeah. But and then I, so they're driving to school and they start arguing about how, you know, the mother doesn't want her seeing seeing Tommy because, you know, he's strange. He sees a psychiatrist and Lindsay is like, hey, I used to see one and it's not that big a deal because I don't remember anything from that night. And I'm like, you don't really have that much to remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is a strange thing that the script does here with uh, the whole mem remembering bit. But Since we'll get it, doesn't, to that. it doesn't really pay off. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, Lindsay insists that, hey, someday Tommy could be a Marvel superhero, and it'll all pay off. Nah. Oh, my God, yeah. It's just like, don't worry, he'll find, he'll find, he'll find Gordon Gecko, and he'll get ant shrinking powers, and he'll save the day from ant, he'll save the day by climbing up Michael Myers' asshole. He'll save the day because a rat saved his ass. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so she um and um Mrs. Wallace, she insists on um going the long way to the school because she wants to avoid driving past the Myers house. Yeah, and uh, uh we then follow Leah here for the next scene where she's uh, looking at the Myers house. And it says it has vines and pumpkins growing in the yard, and the vines are actually growing across the sidewalks. So that's an interesting touch. Yeah, it's like it's still this. Uh, place that they can't get rid of. It's, it's, it's this thorn that they can't get rid of in the town. Yeah. And then we come in our favorite character, Sean! <laughs> Although I yeah. do have to say, do the pumpkins just naturally grow there, or did some dickhead just, just put them there to be funny? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is something I was wondering, because I was just like, how the hell? It, it takes a lot to grow fucking pumpkins. Who grew these things here? And, um, and they, maybe and it's they just make natural. A, and they make a point that they have to go out of town to get pumpkins later. Yeah, maybe they should have had a scene where characters are just going to the Myers house to get their pumpkins, but oh well. <laughs> oh, what can you do? But yeah, Sean comes in, and like, Sean's just like the dick boyfriend you see in all these fucking movies. <laughs> yeah. He's basically Rick Darris from Clerks. <laughs> basically is. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I never real, I never came to that conclusion until now. And uh, they discuss his job at the stop and start, which is a recurring location in Netherson's stories. 
Which I think is a nice touch, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean, he just drives up in his car, and there's apparently some question of him seeing another girl. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, and then uh, Kia, thro- uh, she talks about, uh, Leah says that like, the place kind of gives her the creeps, and Sean taunts her for it and tosses, throws a rock into uh, the Myers house through the window. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, right, be- right before they drive off. Yeah, and Michael walks into the living room and picks up the rock as he watches them leave and crushes the rock in his hands. In the second draft, in the third draft, they get rid of the hand crushing bit. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I think at least, yeah. Uh, yeah. But so, I, I think it's effective to demonstrate how much stronger this version of Michael will be. And yeah, also, also, it's another POV shot. Yeah, yeah. And then we go to the high school, and that's when we meet uh, Brooke, Corey, and Darcy. This is where the character count just goes woof. Yep, just yeah. like, these are—they're not even characters. They're just like they're just like placeholder characters. Yeah, and so I wonder how they would have solved this out. Yeah, because, like, they're literally just there just to mock Lindsay and Tommy. Just like, oh, my God, they're so, like, like even, like, the dialogue is straight up, oh, my, oh, God, Brooke, there's Lindsay Wallace. She's Brody. so lame. Her mother won't let her go out on dates. <laughs> and then just, they're not like that in their other scenes. Yeah. I mean, they're they're sort of silently taunting her throughout the script. Yeah. Which is, like, it, it's just. It's dialogue like that that makes me go like, okay, if this was a Dante movie, I could see it because Dante does do a lot of kind of caricature kind of characters and makes it work, you know, because he has a very cartoony kind of style of a tone, you know. But like just reading it with the tone you you know of Halloween, you're just like, what the fuck is this? What the yeah. And then yeah. after that, uh, we and then after that, uh, Mrs. Wallace drops off Lindsay and demands that she's home after school, and Lindsay insists that she will. Helps, she has to set up with the homecoming dance, and then this is like this is actually a really cool shot. I like scene. I actually always love this. Is when Mrs. Wallace thinks that she sees Michael watching Lindsay going into school and tries to get Lindsay's attention, but Lindsay just completely ignores her. Like I thought, yeah. I thought that was a really cool touch. I was gonna say, do you, uh, you pointed out earlier that uh, Michael has a slightly different appearance in this script. Oh yeah, he wears a coat. Yeah, so sort of like the Man in Black in Halloween Six is what it reminded me of. Although who knows if, if that would survive? Been... Who knows if that would have survived it to the movie, or if they would have just put him in regular Myers clothes, or have him in that bit only in the dream sequence? Yeah, I, I guess I, I kind of could see them just kind of making him like just look like standard Michael Myers, you know, just because you know recognizably sake, and plus he's looked the same in all the other productions, you know. He does the the head tilt in this shot. Oh, yeah, he does. And he does it a lot in this script. It gets ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So Lindsay uh, starts walking into the school where she uh, uh, has a jump scare with, with uh, the creepy teacher. Mr. Uh, this... Crab. <laughs> Mr. Who... Crab. Oh, my God. Who I might accidentally call Mr. Krabs when he shows up again. You know, now I'm just imagining if Clancy Brown was in the movie, had it gotten produced, how <laughs> ironic that would have been. <laughs> Yeah, it would have just he, he probably would have played it exactly like Pet Cemetery too. He probably oh, God. Have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or uh, or, uh, or the Kurgan mom, <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay, <laughs> and uh, they uh, have a brief reference here. The paper Lindsay wrote uh, was about uh, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein's uh, thoughts on uh, fate versus free free will. So going back to the first movie. Yeah, I guess that discussion never leaves the Halloween franchise. And it also, it plays in thematically to what the, uh, what the script is doing. Sure. Yeah. That, like, how, that Michael is just an inevitability due to these circumstances. Yeah. But it's, st- but still though, it's just like, do they teach anything else at this fucking school? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's like, today we're learning about Ludwig's, Ludwig's, yeah, we get it. We, we literally learn this every goddamn day. <laughs> <laughs> But Every Halloween proves itself. Yeah. Lindsay, Lindsay gets saved from this awkward situation with Mr. Crab from, uh, by, uh, her drama teacher, Mrs. Oldfield, character number 17. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Mrs. Wallace just sees that the shape's not there anymore and just goes, drives away. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, Passing by her, though, is uh, Hunt, uh, who's talking to Brackett, or, you know, we'll just call him Brackett just for simplicity's sake here. And, okay, yeah. I have to ask, it's been a while since I read the third draft, but does Hamilton still get the line, keep a tight asshole? 
Uh, let me look that up right now. <laughs> because that line, I'm like, dude, bracket, you're way too interested in the dude's asshole. Hey, you know, like when you when your daughter dies, you get a little you get a little wonky in the head, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, just keep a tight asshole. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then we're introduced to another fucking subplot. <laughs> and this yeah. is the one you could most easily cut out. Well, yeah. anyway, um. Hunt is, uh, well, first, Hunt is told to go to um, uh, a local store due to a break-in. Yeah, it's the shop in the bag. Yeah. We'll get back to that later. Um, then we start to hear um, uh, the soybean and pork bellies report <laughs> uh, from the newscaster because Hunt switches stations. Uh, and speaking of stations, we go to the local uh, TV station, w, uh, W-A-R. Wah! Yeah. What is it good for? Exactly. Well, in, uh, there's a nice K and B reference in Halloween Six with the radio station being W K and B. Yeah. But anyway, we're introduced again to uh, Monday, who uh, comes in, and the uh, Halloween anti Halloweeners uh, have uh, are now protesting uh, at the station due to uh, their concerns over what's being broadcast. Actually, it's over. It's due to um, promoting uh, them promoting the Lost River Drive-In, which is also a location referenced in the second movie. And uh, not only that, but it is a uh, real drive-in in in Carpenter's hometown. Which I thought was a nice touch. I I always love how they integrate, like, shit that actually grew up on into these Halloween movies. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, he's confronted by uh, Mrs. Wallace, uh, who actually slaps him. Oh, wow. (laughs) I don't remember that at all. (laughs) It happens in the second draft, so maybe that was taken out of the third. I I don't know. That's but yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, you know, this guy doesn't decide what the commercials are. Yeah, that's like that's like a network thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not like Geraldo Rivera getting a chair uh, slammed into his face. <laughs> uh, so uh, after there are uh, after Mrs. Wallace's complaints, uh, Barry, the uh, news director, uh, saves Monday's ass and says, "File uh, your complaints with the FCC," and uh, pulls uh, Robert into his office. Uh, where they discuss that they need some form of a Halloween segment because they just can't compete with other towns, essentially. Yeah. And over here, it's uh, isn't it set up that they're going to do a retrospective of the Myers murders? Yes. Yeah, all in a day. Wait, how the hell are you going to do that? <laughs> yeah, this is like forgetting to turn in that important assignment of yours in college, you know? <laughs> and, I, I know exactly. Yeah, and so they had to, like... Finish like editing your video all in the day, shooting it, interviewing and editing all all in one day. Oh my god! I just realized this is literally the same plot as the podcasters in Halloween 2018. Yeah, that's why we kind of decided at some point to axe this part of the script for our rewrite. Yeah, because I was like, because I'm like, it's just like this is literally the exact same shit. They do the they do the exact same thing. Well, they go to different locations, but it's like plot. No, they, go, they go to the they go to Smith's Grove in both of them. Oh, yeah, they do, right? Yeah, just different placeholders, but God, it's the exact same thing. I didn't, that kind of makes you wonder, but. And they, they try to talk to Lori, but no one knows where she is. Um, and also didn't, uh, wasn't Dana Carvey's character actually named, or was he just an assistant? I think he's just an assistant. But he yeah. is in the credits, but I believe in the script he might have been given a name, uh, for Halloween 2. I don't remember if he's not if he's not in the if he's not named in the script then I think it might have been named Barry so though it'd be funny if like he went from like being like personal assistant to the producer in Halloween two to then being the news director. Yeah, I know we talked about it with our rewrite, but I digress. <laughs> yeah, we originally wanted like the cameraman character that goes along with money to be Dana Carvey, but we just decided like, eh, this is just adding too much. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so next up what happens is that Lindsay, between classes, she finds this note stuffed in her locker, and she's about to read it, but she feels like she's being watched. There's, like, maybe shadowy figures moving on at the end of the hallway. And eventually, she finally reads it in the classroom. It says to come to Biology Lab 1 during their lunch period. Yep, and then uh, that's when they, they go into the... Uh... Where does it go? Oh, they, uh, Lindsay goes into the biology lab where there's cage rats receiving timed electric shocks that Tommy refers to as a stress rig. <laughs> yeah, and compares it to the town. Yeah, it's basically trying to say like that. Like it, it's it's basically explaining why they don't want Halloween in uh, Haddonfield anymore. I I believe is the point of it, uh, or just uh, the uh, mental state that all the townspeople are in. I think. Yeah, which I'm not sure if you necessarily needed. 
that to explain it, because I think we get the idea that it's like, we get why they're like this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we even just wanted to be extra creepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, hey, does this turn you on? Just... Like, I'm electrocuting rats. It's like, Tommy, you've done, you did this the last time. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're talking, and it's like, the idea basically is the idea of control through fear, and that their fear is going, that, that fear can change things. He talks about, like, how the glands change and stuff like that. And then Lindsay starts remembering during this scene, and that's the last hear of it. Yeah, so I think in our rewrite, we might ax the whole forgetting bit. If not, we'll try to play it out. Nothing. It adds nothing. Because, I mean, all Lindsay has to forget is seeing a weird guy in a mask on the staircase. Yeah, it's not like she ever saw a dead body, as far as we know. Yeah, and plus Michael, like, never actively tried to kill her in the movie. Like, or Tommy. Or Tommy. So it's like, so it's like, yeah, they're probably traumatized by association, but it's like, and plus they were so young, I don't know how it would really affect like traumatize him. I think it would affect Tommy just because he didn't shut up about the boogeyman in the first film. Yeah, but like Lindsay had like barely anything to do with it, so it's like yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I could see a point being made maybe where like you know, you know, all this stuff happened in Lindsay's house when she's had to live there for years, knowing about that. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the only bit, and it would probably affect her mother way more than it would affect her. And yeah. maybe her mother is sort of like peddling her insecurities onto Lindsay, which I think is the intent. Yeah. Um, but also the script was inspired by due to uh, the, like the bad rap that like uh, the horror genre got in like the fifties and the eighties um, that I think Edgerson picked up on. Mm-hmm. So I guess we should have said that during our backstory section, but it's, it's fine to point it out here. So, yeah. And I do like that tone, how it's kind of going like, it's like, it's a theme about censorship and like kind of like, Fear mongering. I think that's a great theme to work on, especially with the co- with the history of Haddonfield in these movies. But if it's well done, I mean that's up to you. <laughs> also, Tommy says that the boogeyman is dead and that they don't have to continue to live in the fear that uh, the adults created. Um, and the, this fear would be that like any kid could become another Michael Myers. Yeah. And then, meanwhile, uh, moving on to the next scene, we're at the shop and bag. Yeah, Hunt finally got there. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and then like on the place, it's graffitied with lines that, like "Halloween is back." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then inside the store is ransacked, and Hunt investigates the place while talking to uh, Mister Severin, the manager, and uh, Hal, the assistant. And then Hunt discovers there's a storeroom where they illegally sell Halloween merchandise, like where it's all stored. Yeah. And right before that, I want to point this out because I thought it was pretty funny. Like, like the assistants, like, cause, cause Hunt's like, Oh, what about the storeroom? And, and the assistants like, well, uh, and the manager's just like, Ixnay, Ixnay. Oh, he couldn't have come in through there. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. yeah that, like you see, it's caricatures like that where it's like, okay, I can, I can roll with this if Dante was directing it, but it's like, He's in it for one minute, so it's like I can forgive it more than, like, Darcy or whatnot. They discover uh, the uh, dead dog, the store dog, Peppy. Yeah. Because yeah, they, they they thought it was just missing, and then they, they knock over some of the crates, and they find it's, like, hanging from the skylight. That's such a grisly image. Could, could they have gotten away with that in 1987? I would assume so. I mean, maybe, they, maybe the MPAA might have cracked down on it, but who knows? I mean, yeah. would they crack down on a dog? I mean, they're very, they're very anal, and but they're also very inconsistent with their own judgment. Yeah, that's true. And plus, in the first one, they you straight up see a dog getting strangled to death. So true, but it's in like the shadows, and there's really no blood. That is that is fair too. Where this one's a little bit more grisly. I don't know. I guess it it get we'll never know. Like, Michael's canine body count goes up in this one. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, we also see more uh, graffiti, like "Long Live Halloween" or "Trick or Treat." And he lives. He he lives is right next to the dog in its blood. Which and then like which then uh, Mundy and his cameraman crew drive to the sanitarium while listening to news reports. After this, uh, uh, right and right before we cut to that, Hunt is uh, listening to his radio and he gets mo- reports of even more break-ins. Yeah, yeah. It should also be uh, pointed out here about um, Smith's Grove that in the first movie they say it's 150 miles away. Yeah. So two and a half hours, uh, one way. But some of the sequels kind of forget that. I think Halloween 2018 kind of forgot about that. Yeah. Which I will admit, like, this whole scene in the mall is such an, 
effective scene. I like kind of the setup they were going for with it. Because what were they kind of setting it up that they were like copycat? Copy yeah, there's like some kids later. We'll get to that. And so I don't know if we're meant to interpret that they were doing some of this stuff. Well, they they, they talk about it later. We'll get to that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Mundy and his cameraman arrive at Smith's Grove where we see some patients doing odd things. And then we're introduced to Dr. Marion Stern, who is supposed to be the nurse from Halloween 1 and 2. Yeah. And then later in Halloween H2O and again going to be in Halloween Kills. Oh. I, I forgot she was cast at Halloween Kills. I forgot she was. They're casting everybody, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not surprising, but. I yeah. Not... Well, she's married to Rick Rosenthal. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's true. Also, before they go in and get introduced, we see the patients outside again, and they get a rabbit out of the hole and catch it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that wasn't made entirely clear, even though she said it at one point, but it took me a while to think, like, who is this character supposed to be? Oh, it's the nurse character. I guess she became a doctor, which is something that doesn't really happen. <laughs> yeah, I was confused yeah. at first, too, because I'm like, wait a minute. Did this character have a last name? I cannot remember. It, it changes. Like, in, in like novelization, it's, like, Winningham for Halloween 2. It's, like, Nurse Chambers. And then in um, uh, H2O, it's a different last name. And I think in Halloween Kills, they're going back to her original last name. I, think I mean, just... in the credit, she's only ever just referred to as Marion. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just not made clear because it's, like, this was, like, Carpenter and Hill were still working on this. So I think they were just like, well, we know who it is, so you don't have to say it. You know what I mean? Sure, but I mean, you would think there'd be more of a line in dialogue saying, like, I was transporting Michael that night, you know? Yeah, you'd, you'd think. Maybe they just kind of assumed, like, I, I could see it being like they assumed, like, well, it's the same actress, so I think people will get the point. Well, sure, but she, been, she, yeah. she does have a line where she says, I was there when he broke out. Yeah, but I didn't pick up on it at first. I thought it was a retcon, and there is a retcon with her character in the third draft. We'll get to that eventually, but, um, uh, uh, Mundy starts interviewing, um, uh, Stern uh, about um, Michael and his legacy, I guess. Yeah, I know, like, uh, like, wasn't there, like, in one of the drafts, I don't remember which one, w did, wasn't there, like, a tape that they had uh, where Loomis is actually, like, talking? Yes. Oh. Yeah, we'll get to that. Is there anything yes. uh, anything else we need to set up to get to that? Well, bef I think before they watch the video, she, she starts talking about how, well, Michael was never convicted of his crime because he was a minor, and she talks about, how, oh, for all we know, he was just in shock from having found the body. Right. Yeah. She's like, she seems to be oddly sympathetic towards him. <laughs> well, I mean, she, I mean, it was only Loomis in the first movie who recognizes it from the start that, uh, he's dealing with something that's not a regular patient. Right. And she's like, you be, you mean it, we should refer to him or something like that? And like, yeah. um, and Loomis says, you know, oh, I guess if, if you want, you know. Yeah. But it's just like, it's rarely addressed, it, like, say for that line, though, it's not even really addressed much in two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then, and she also says that, oh, after years and years of being told he was a monster, he, he finally became one. He and then, was expected of him. Yeah, and then, like, uh, the other patients in the hospital grew to believe it as well. And she actually says something here where she says, oh, Lewis thought he was the reincarnation of a, of a pagan death god, and I'm like, that's not what he says in Halloween too. <laughs> yeah, supposed all. to be. Well, isn't it supposed to be a reference to like the first movie's novelization? Yeah, yeah, it's that. That's in the novelization, but all you get in the movies is he uses the 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 Samhain thing as a uh, as like as like a metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Well, also the other thing about Michael in the first movie's novelization is the writer describes him as having an erection. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, so like he's getting like a sexual pleasure out of like uh, of the killing that he's doing. Oh my god! Now I'm just imagining just Michael Myers jerking it after killing the dog. Jesus. Well, apparently there was a case of like somebody who like found a USB uh, thing with a uh, and had a guy dressed up as Michael with his dick out. Oh god! Like, Jesus Christ Almighty! Yeah, this was not the Randy Pitchford USB, was it? <laughs> oh my <No>. god! <laughs> it, it was a magic trick. Oh God! The, the 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 twist what the twist all along was that that Michael Myers was Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> no, the twist was that he was the Vince Vaughn Norman Bates. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> Fucking hell! <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, to uh to to get back to the point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, she puts in a VHS tape, which is a transfer of a film reel. 
from around what 1965, give or take. I think so. I yeah, think. it's it's in the 60s. Yeah, and in the second draft, it's Dr. Loomis who is interviewing him. But then the third draft makes a retcon of it. I guess they were thinking like maybe we don't want to get Donald Pleasants back for a cameo, but uh, they changed it to Dr. Stern, uh, which would make no sense because she wasn't a doctor at that point, nor has she not met Michael at that point. Exactly. I can see why they would have changed it because Loomis is kind of out of character here. Uh, how so? He's like, he's like being awfully verbally abusive to the little kid and is about to smack him around. He's more, he's yeah. more Halloween 5 Loomis than Halloween 1 Loomis. Yeah. You know where he is! Yes. Tell me, Jamie! Oh my god. Yeah. Go See, home, I... Michael! Go home! See, I blocked most of Halloween 5 out of my brain, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, should we do a reenactment of the scene here? No. Uh, <laughs> what? Why don't we? It's not that long, I think. Okay, I guess that's fair. <laughs> okay, um, what page is it? It starts on uh, page uh, 43. On uh, scene uh, 72. Yeah, there, I have it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do uh, the narrator and I can do Loomis? I'll, I'll do the narrator. Okay. VCR footage, a clean, sterile room, bright windows, bars... See it on a stool as a boy of nine or ten back to camera, staring through the bars at the sun. Seated on another stool is Dr. Sam Loomis. Michael. Mike. The boy does not move. Mikey. Is that uh, what they call you? Talk to me, Mikey. Tell me about your mother and father. Your sister. Do you remember your sister? What happened to her? Loomis gets up, paces. For three years, we've been doing this. I'm losing my patience, Mikey. It's true. But I'm not going to give up. You think you can uh, wear me down. You won't win, you know. I'm going to see this through to the end, no matter how long it takes. Loomis turns to the camera, sweating. You can turn that off now. He's not going to say anything. Waste of time. But the tape does not stop. Loomis approaches the boy, becoming angry. You think you're fooling everybody, don't you? Well, I know your game. I've seen it played by experts. It won't work. You're not fooling me. I know who you are, what you are. Loomis leans over the stool, shouting, enraged. Mikey, that's a name for a human boy. And you're not that, are you? Your name must be, let's see. Does your kind even have a name? What do they call you in the place where uh, you came from? What's the proper name for evil these days? Answer me by God or I'll... Loomis raises his fist. The boy starts to turn from the window, cocking his head to one side. There it is again. <laughs> I mean, it is cool seeing the little kid do it, but I can see what you mean by Loomis is a little over-the-top angry on this. Okay, in the uh, third draft, she says, Michael, Mike, Mikey, is that what they call you? Talk to me, Mikey. Tell me about your mother and your uh, father, your sister. Do you remember your sister? What really happened to her? Sighing. You may as well turn it off. He's not going to say anything. He can't. We have the famous Dr. Loomis to thank for that. So it's a much shorter scene in the uh, in the third draft. And, yeah. it doesn't, and it doesn't kind of throw Loomis under the bus. And I get what they're doing here because well, sorry, somebody it does, but in, indirect. And I get what they're doing here because it – it is like, you know, a doctor would probably think, you know, maybe he was influenced by the not entirely altogether psychiatrist, but it, I don't think having literal VCR footage of him about to hit the kid for not talking to him. Yeah, you, you, you'd be surprised. How the hell was he his doctor for 15 fucking years at that point? <laughs> yeah. And it says he's nine or 10, so that would make it 66 or 67. Yeah, because he commits the murder when he's six years old in 63. Oh, crap. I actually got the math right. I can't believe it. Yeah, I was trying to remember it because uh, I got it wrong by saying 65. Yeah. All right. So um, so while this whole thing is going on in the hallway, the cameraman is, you know, uh, is, is sitting around. And I forgot to mention the scene earlier when they're driving out to the uh, the asylum where he accidentally chucks Mundy's uh, lighter out the window. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, but, you know, he's sitting out there in the hallway because Stern wouldn't let him come into the office. And he decides to start poking around. He goes into the day room. And he gets jumped by by those three patients from before, and two orderlies rescue him, and right as he leaves, he sees that an altar of sorts has been set up with a white figure in a black coat labeled Lord of the Dead. 
the rabbit dead at its feet is some kind of sacrifice. So yeah, we saw the mental patients screwing around with the animal earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and and the one and the ringleader was called priest. Yeah. We get to then subplot what number four? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, this is like we only see Mundy like twice more in this whole thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, give or take. <laughs> and plus, it's like it, it's exposition that it's like save for the stuff with the with the patients you don't need. Honestly, like we get the point. We saw the two other movies. We saw um, and so that's, that's kind of why we decided ultimately to cut this, even though I love this bit. Uh, yeah. we decided to like reincorporate the whole Lord of the Dead imagery into another bit later. Yeah, cause I mean, I mean, that whole scene with the David was actually really cool. And also it's worth mentioning that this does establish that Loomis did indeed die in the fire in this version. Which I'm, I hate to say I'm fine with to some degree, but. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it too, but. Yeah, so like, then, it's hard. I mean, I, I can believe Michael surviving it. I can't. It's hard to believe, like, a old man who, who was actually, holding the lighter. Yeah, it's hard to believe he would fucking survive. <laughs> yeah. Granted, in Halloween 4, I'm willing to go with it. Yeah. Because it's Halloween 4. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now we're at the alarm house where we meet uh, up again with Lonnie, Richie, and Keith um, as they're carrying boxes of booze from a, a hearse into Lonnie's garage. And they are specifically the same three kids from Halloween 1. Well, yeah. Not, and Lonnie did make it past the sixth grade. Surprisingly. I mean, like, it took him three times, but he's there. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're loading a hearse full of alcohol. I was going to say, this must be uh, his, uh, um, er, uh, the uh, time he was experimenting out in the woods with peyote. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, then, they're, then we, they're interrupted by Darcy, who flirts with Lonnie, and Lonnie's little brother, Billy, comes along to annoy Lonnie. Darcy goes back to school as the lunch hour is almost over, and... For but, such an uptight town, it's surprising that they have uh, that they let students uh, have off-campus lunches. Yeah, like I didn't even have off-campus lunch. I <laughs> Neither did I. Maybe she snuck out, but still. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this was the uh, the inspiration for the off-campus lunch thing. H two O. Yeah. Maybe. But John, you're not allowed to have a little off-campus lunch. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck, John? <laughs> When we're introduced to Darcy in this scene, it just makes me go, like, why didn't they just introduce, like, all six of these, like, teenager characters just at that point? Because it's, like, they 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 don't separate, I don't believe, beyond this point, save for Darcy. Yeah. I mean, even 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 Halloween 5 more or less introduces you to, to the cannon fodder right away. Yeah. In a more effective manner, even. Yeah. Oh, so shit, like, am I complimenting Halloween 5 now? Although, I will say, these characters are nowhere near as annoying. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, man, you could, the guy who gets his car scratched. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these ones, like, as caricatures as they are, they're at least entertaining. <laughs> and I will say Lonnie is actually a fairly decent character as we, he has his little awkward moments, and he works okay. Yeah. Yeah, and plus, I feel like Dar like Darcy and the girls, they work better with, like, Lonnie, Richie, and Keith anyway, so it's just like, well, why didn't you just introduce them all together? <laughs> yes, yeah, so they're not being the mean girls when they're with the boys. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because then, and, hey, then, 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 they could be real people! <laughs> Imagine that. So anyway, uh, she goes back, um, and they, there's, um, she asks them if they're the guys who've been breaking into all the stores, and they deny it. Which, I thought that would have been, like, an interesting, like, kind of I thought that could have been something that they could have, like, lingered on. Like, maybe they had something to do with it. Like, if they opened a more mischievous side to these characters, but, you know. Yeah, although, there's it, another group that we get introduced to later. Although, although thinking about the uh, the break-ins, is so I guess in, you know, you know, in the ten years and being a ghost and whatnot, Michael has expanded his criminal operations. He's well, not just breaking into one store, he's breaking into all of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to get a little Juan burrito, as was pointed out earlier. Oh, I forgot about the burrito. <laughs> although that might have been, yeah, or though it might have been the other characters who got it. So Yeah. No, that that's that's the thing that's fucking contagious and had in people. It's not killing people, it's getting boners for criminal activity. <laughs> yeah. Getting a boner for eating a frozen burrito raw. Maybe oh if maybe if Michael was resurrected now, you walk around to the local Taco Bell and go, oh, wait, they have Dorito tacos now? Oh, what a time to be alive. <laughs> that, 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 that or it was one of those one of those burritos from from the clerk's cartoon. Oh, God. <laughs> But yeah, uh, anyway, getting back to uh, uh she goes back to the school and overhears uh Monday trying to talk to the uh, um secretary. Man, they got back quick. Yeah. yeah. A two and a half hour drive. 
Yeah. That's a long ass lunch period. That's a... they, they, maybe they caught a ride from uh, Joe Grizzly. No, like, I'm Joe Grizzly, bitch! <laughs> <laughs> well, so anyway, um, they're trying to get information on Laurie Strode, and they can't get anywhere. And then uh, Darcy flirts with the cameraman. Oh my god! <laughs> and then and the cameraman's like filming her ass as she walks away. <laughs> she, I, I, that happens. Yes, no. I forgot about that. Oh my god! Where is this? Oh my god! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh my god! <laughs> Jesus Christ. And she gets Mundy to sign her arm too. What the hell? Oh my god. Yeah. When she uh, leaves, she bumps into Tommy and is startled by Tommy. And in the second draft, she actually calls Tommy a retard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, the, the dialogue between uh, Mundy and the cameraman as he films her butt is like, you're an animal. New talent. She's got a lot of potential. So those are the Weinstein brothers in this script. <laughs> but yeah, she bumps she bumps into Tommy, who at first is um just barely half glimpsed, so he's another fake-out shape. Yeah. yeah. Then she goes, stay away from me, dot, 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 retard. God. <laughs> just, just straight, it sounds like she was, like, trying to think about that insult. Like, do me a favor, stay away from me. Retard! She was thinking in her head, what would be less offensive, calling him a faggot or a retard? Yeah. <laughs> it is the 80s, after all. Yep. It's just, no, no, it's... then... All right, so go Yeah, on. but then Tommy, he, um... Oh, I, I, this... this, this, this this um this description is funny. Tommy's face shows hurt, misunderstood again. He stares after her sadly as she walks away. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! No, he's gonna masturbate to her uh, by looking at her yearbook photo that night. <laughs> no, that or the cameraman's gonna do that. Both of them are. Oh my god! He's getting interviewed outside, but Tommy keeps giving these weird evasive answers. Yeah, he and, the on purpose. And then Tommy eventually just gives him crap, saying that he's not letting the past die, and that he's responsible for stuff bubbling back up again. Tommy's stances in this script are kind of weird, because I feel like he's, like, I don't know, shouldn't he think that the Boogeyman's going to return now? Shouldn't he be that kind of character? His lines are too vague, because it seems to go one way and then the other every now and then. But shouldn't he be, like, kind of like the Tommy Jarvis of this, and that he believes uh, Michael's going to come back? I'm just, I'm just imagining the friggin' pre-recorded lines from the video game. Jason's back. I dug up his body. Uh, I was thinking of Monday. Uh, I was thinking of Monday saying to him, "You know, there's help for there uh, out there for people like you. It's called electroshock therapy." <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> yeah, that <one> sucks. <laughs> Fuck. But then in the uh, we go to the school auditorium where Lindsay is helping set the decorations for the dance, which I don't know how you would dance in an auditorium, but more likely the gymnasium. But, yeah, I well. mean, I mean, at some of my schools, the, the gymnasium doubled as an auditorium. But that's, that's why I'm just it assuming that they were kind of going for it. Yeah. Well, I went to a fairly large high school, so we could afford both. <laughs> but yeah, she's there helping out, and then the three girls are there discussing. And I didn't even bother writing down their names, but it, it's Corey, Brooke, and well, Darcy's out now. She's oh yeah, so it's just Corey. It's just Corey and Brooke chatting. Yeah. yeah. So Leah is still missing. Yeah. But uh, Corey and Brooke are chatting, going, oh, we're going to do all this stuff tonight, the guys, blah, blah, blah. And then they see Lindsay coming in, and she, Lindsay has to go backstage to get some stuff for the dance, and she runs into a black-clad figure, but it turns out it's just a dummy, and it's got a heart with LW plus TD written on it, in, written on it inside a heart, and it was a prank set up by the girls. Then Mrs. Oldfields comes in, and she's being basically the teacher from Carrie, she goes backstage again to help get rid of that prank doll, and she moves some signs that she finds a hidden, some ha hidden Halloween decorations, which are a cardboard witch, skeleton, and black cat, and they missed a trick not making the third one a pumpkin. Yeah. Well, what can you do? Oh, just give it to uh, Marcus uh, Dunstan and uh, Patrick Melton. No. Oh, do God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, and they'll make a very confusing continuity. Yep. Yep. So anyway, and then we start... Now we're we get to the big scene that was the first, like, excerpt that we actually read of this thing. Yep. So it's, um, it's over outside in the pumpkin patch. Darcy's looking through all the pumpkins and... And it's, it's just outside the city limits. Yeah. yeah. And she's getting, like, uh, hit on by this, like, pro like, this prospector guy. Um, which yeah. is, like, is everyone in Haddonfield, like, a creeper? A perv. <laughs> well... I mean, come on! In Rob Zombie's Halloween too, they're talking about fucking a, a dead teenager. Fair well, enough. One of those, okay. one, well, one of those two guys is Richard Brake. So yeah, 
Yeah. But anyway, that lasts for a bit. And then um, Darcy starts going around picking out uh, pumpkins. And she just keeps screw- she's screwing up and, like, falling into rotten pumpkins. And I'm just like, there's, like, a level of slapstick to this, which I don't understand. <laughs> I'm like, aren't pumpkins a little tougher than that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like they're rolling down like bowling balls. Yeah, like <laughs> like reading it, it's just like you'd read this and it's just like this is this sounds very slapsticky, which again, like for like a tone like Joe Dante's, I felt like probably could have figured out a way to make it work, but it just comes off kind of weird. But And she gets knocked off her feet by a pumpkin. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. how klutzy can you get? But anyway, she uh she gets knocked over, and then she tries to get up. A stack, like a stack of pumpkins fall over, and a scarecrow collapses on her. Which I'm like, and it, yeah. And it's described as being like a full-on avalanche of pumpkins. <laughs> it's, it's like that's the scariest thing in the script now. Pumpkins. What did yeah. pumpkins the, do to Etcherson? <laughs> and the, and then the shape bursts out from underneath the pumpkins. I love this image. Yeah, it it, it is a great image of just. Michael just coming out of the pumpkins. That is that is a very cool image. And I believe in the uh in the Blumhouse interview, Etcherson said he thought that would have been a nice image for the poster. Didn't he say that? Yeah, he did. And on the Halloween Twenty Five Years of Terror documentary, there's a drawing of a burning stack of pumpkins with like Michael popping out of it. Nice. If oh, can, cool. Yeah. If we can find it, we should make that the uh episode thumbnail, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, if I can find I'd I'd have to go through that thing and look for it frame by frame now. It's uploaded to YouTube, but But anyway, uh you can you can kind of expect what goes on. Darcy starts screaming for help and then uh and then Michael grabs her and stabs her. You see blood spatter on the pumpkins. Yeah. yeah. And also we should mention the reason the proprietor isn't there and doesn't see anything is because he is across the street refilling his flask at the liquors. Yeah. <laughs> Which I didn't know liquor stores had, like, fucking Coke, like, Coke dispensers of liquor. Hey, you need to buy a drink. You can't just keep coming in here for refills. <laughs> but, that, but yeah, that's our first Michael scene about an hour into the script. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another complaint that I have is that it's just taking a little too long to get to Michael. Yeah, and, like... And I understand the buildup, but, yeah. And plus, it's, and- like... It's just, like, the buildup is exactly the same. You get the same fake out, like, three times. <laughs> Yeah, and if you cut out the Monday stuff. <laughs> yeah. It would occur much earlier than. Yeah. Which it's like, I, like, I appreciate what they were going for, and I do like that, like, they took their time, and then, like, when he shows up, it's like a big reveal, but, like, even then, like, it's like, come on, you could have Michael at least be around, and then you have his, like, big full reveal. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, and we talked about for our rewrite, we'll, we'll have much more of Michael in our rewrite, but there'll be still that build up with him. Right, yeah, we, yeah. Anyway, so, uh. We, we, uh, jump to the PTA meeting. Yep. Yeah. Where the parents are all pissed off and in a fury over Halloween showing up, and they're upset about the Lost River drive in, and the guy who runs it shows up and goes, like, hey, I gotta make a living, and that makes things worse, and Mrs. Oldfield, who apparently is not a native, she starts arguing that they should start moving yeah, on. Yeah, she's a New York transplant. Yeah, and it just starts, <laughs> it almost turns into a full scale riot. Uh, I do expect that out of this type of setting, though. So yeah, yeah. and um, like then, like the board member is like he's like he's like smacking his hammer till it breaks. Yeah. Oh, by the way, for the proprietor, I would have uh, guessed like John Carradine could have played that proprietor if he had still been alive at this point. I mean, he right. died. He died in '87. But for the uh, drive-in owner, Dick Miller. Dick Miller had to be in here somewhere if it was Joe Dante. <laughs> yeah, I don't. You know, either been the creepy teacher or uh, the drive-in owner, but I think the drive-in owner would suit him. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And Tommy, for some reason, is watching a PTA meeting. Yeah. How did he get out of the school? That's why I'm starting to want to well, school out at this point. Yeah, it's already yeah. out. Because if it was the lunch period still, I swear to God. I swear. <laughs> yeah, but I like um, Mrs. Oldfield's speeches that, um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Because, uh, like, the drive-in owner is saying, like, hey, didn't you guys watch horror movies? And they're like, oh, but that, that was different. Yeah. Then, um... Uh, Miss Oldfield says, uh, you all know me, most of you anyway, this is, uh, my home now, but I'm not a native, and I may see things a li- uh, in a different perspective, and I'm seeing something that scares me, and, uh, crowd's like, yeah, uh, Mrs. Oldfield, hear me out, I see a warm, caring town that, uh, worked itself into a frenzy, pretending that the rest of the world doesn't exist. 
You've hidden away and uh, blindfolded yourselves, but your children know better, Mrs. Nolan. Better they shouldn't, uh, Mrs. Oldfield. Uh, I know your children. In some ways, I may know them better than you do. Uh, don't tell an angry mob of parents that. <laughs> Just oh, my no. no, definitely yeah. not. Yeah, <laughs> you've settled Reagan era parents. Oh yeah, you've settled them with a fear that uh, could turn into something uh, nobody wants. Mrs. Wallace, sit down. It came before and it will again. We're here talking uh, when we should be home uh, protecting our children. So yeah, Mrs. Wallace is back in the script now. Yeah, finally, and we. But yeah, the whole the whole thing continues, and we should probably we should probably uh, expedite yeah, yeah, yeah. the episode a little bit. Well, anyway, um, she gives a really good speech here that I like about um how they need to let their children grow up at some point. Yeah, but then Mrs. Oldfield, she's in one more scene, and then she disappears. Yeah, like everyone else in this freaking script. Like, <laughs> yeah, but uh, so Tommy he slips out of there, and he goes to call Lindsay. And they're talking, and he's trying to set up a meeting, but they both kind of get distracted. Lindsay's father is trying to talk to her, and Tommy sees a shape moving towards a van. Think he thinks he sees it, so he runs over to check it out and rips the mask off, but it turns out it's just a teenage boy. And there's two others who are in the van, and they're looking through the uh, stolen Halloween merchandise in the back. And Hunt shows up and looks like he's going to pull his gun on the boys, so Tommy tackles him. And two of them get away, but Tommy and the third boy get arrested, and he literally is just called Boy. Yes. Yeah. This, kind of, uh, this kind of reminds me of, like, the kids who do freak out Loomis and uh, Hunt, um, Meeker in Halloween 4 with their Michael masks. Oh, and it gets a little bit closer to that by the end. Oh, yeah. And so... uh Bracket and Hunt drive them to the station, and Bracket is insisting Michael Myers died in the hospital fire, even though his and Loomis's remains were melted together and are impossible to tell apart, but Hunt is, you know, getting more and more paranoid. And also, Bracket says, I saw him burned, and I'm like, bullshit, you were nowhere near that fire. You ought yeah. to be, like, checked out because your daughter died. <laughs> yeah, and not only that, but also, Michael didn't die right next to Loomis. He walked around uh, trying to find Laurie and then collapsed from the flames. Yeah, yeah, he did the the, the, the Frankenstein thing. and mm -hmm. But um, as they pass by the Myers house, Billy and and two of his friends approach. So Billy's back in this again. Yeah, and so hearing, can... hearing what their his brother did uh, ten years earlier, nine years earlier. Yeah, and so they, him and two of his friends approach, but before he can, you know, get to the door, the do his dog, who had followed him, runs around and inside the house, and there's a sound of a struggle being heard within before the dog comes flying out the window, and they all run away, and this is a dog that survived Michael, I can't believe it. Oh, well, wait no. until you get to our rewrite, but, uh... <laughs> oh, God. But, but, uh, Billy and the dog head home, where the dog starts to choke, and it coughs up two severed human fingers, and Billy just chucks them in the garbage disposal. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you see severed body parts. Just like, ew, body. Just throw it in the garbage. No one's going to care. And Billy is not in the script after this point. Yeah. Yep. At the police station, Hunt starts to get violent with the other boy, who insists, he says the store was already broken into when they took the stuff from it. Yeah, he gets all and Jack then, Bauer on him. Yeah, and he's, like, trying to, like, break his arm. And then Brackett goes to intervene, but it only makes it worse. And then Tommy just snatches Hunt's forty four and holds him at gunpoint before running away. <laughs> Which, yeah, that's possible. Well, I mean, uh, you did see Jason goes to hell, but granted, Jason was, like, storming the place at that point. Yeah, exactly. This is this is just at a calm police station. Yeah, apparently there's only two cops in all of Haddonfield. In a, in a, in a town this conservative, it's hard to believe that. <laughs> Yeah. And also, and also, every time Bracket is in this script, he mentions, "Oh, well, I've got backup coming from Warren County, and when are they going to get here?" And that's kind I've of something them already by rolling pumpkins down them. Yeah, and that's kind of a plot point that made it into the the Halloween Four. Yeah, they're have. waiting for the cavalry. But anyway, um, after that, we get into the stop and st start market. Hey, remember Sean? We showed up once in the very beginning of the script. Well, he's back. <laughs> and he's got Jennifer in the back room, and he's forced to keep stopping and starting with her because customers keep showing up. And oh, is that why it's called Stop and like... Start? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, it could be a coincidence. I don't know. But, he's going uh, but... to little, he's gonna have to have a little, like, start, start and stop, uh, stop and start quickie with her, you know? And there's these, there's, like, these weird people who keep showing up. Like, there's a wino who wants pine salt or something. Yeah. Yeah. You got a hooker. Yeah, bag lady. 
It's just, it, it straight up becomes Clerks. It's yeah. And, and then some kids show up. Oh, it very much becomes Clerks in a minute. But, yeah. But uh, some kids show up looking for masks, and he gives them some, and then this other teenager shows up wanting vodka mixer. It's a kid, actually, a little kid. Oh, okay. <laughs> or is it? Uh, I don't know. Like, there's so many people coming in. But eventually he finally just gives up and goes in back with Jennifer, who's watching Assault on Precinct 13 on TV. <laughs> God, pat yourself on the back, why don't you? It gets worse. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a joke that Sean Clark makes in his Halloween 3 episode of uh, uh, Horror's Hollow Grounds. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Have, they haven't done one of those in a while. Yeah. They're having sex, and suddenly she's like, gee, Sean, calm down. Yeah. And then... And then, and then, like, the camera moves, and we see that Michael is just shoving him into her, and he, he's dead and has a knife in his back, which, that reminded me of two things. Clerks, with the dead guy, and mm. uh, ass shove assistance from Midsummer. Oh, my God. Well, I was going to say, it reminded us of a uh, scene in uh, Hatchet 2. Oh, God, yeah, I remember that scene. <laughs> yeah, you like this more than Jesus? Oh, that's not appropriate. You like this more than baby Jesus? <laughs> Jesus Christ. You like this more than ice cream? You like this more than chocolate ice cream? <laughs> oh, God. Dude. But no, he then uh, slits her throat as she's getting fucked by the dead guy. Yeah. Which, is, which is like, okay, I mean, okay, no, I can believe that a dead guy has a boner, but like, how the hell do you just not notice that he's dead? <laughs> Especially when the blood was sprayed, you know, and whatnot, but uh, it's a very good scene, though, I think. It is. It's, it's, it's just, it just borders on, like, being kind of, like, Again, like, kind of very over the top, but uh, it, it fits in the tone of the whole script, I feel. Yeah. 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 But she said she did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, then the phone rings, yeah. and the shape is basically just standing there listening, and then we cut to the school where Leah is calling Sean. Yeah, yeah. Leah's back. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we have uh, then uh, Lonnie, Brooke, Corey, and Keith and Richie sneaking out then. Yeah, and we have Lindsay alone at the dance, and we get another Mr. Crab scene. Bracket, Hunt, Bracket shows up looking for Tommy. He talks to Mrs. Oldfield, and then Mrs. Oldfield talks to Lindsay, and she goes, like, I gotta get out of here. Could you cover for me? And she goes, okay, and then she's out of the script. Yep. Never to be seen again. <laughs> yep. And she sneaks out and runs into Leah, who suggests that, oh, well, everybody's gonna be at the drive-in, so might as well look for Tommy there. And then we go to, uh, the hearse has already arrived there. And, uh, and so Keith and Corey go into the back for sex while the rest are still in the front. And it's like three movies are playing. It's what reanimator Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I'm trying to remember what else they have listed Chris here. Christine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another meta reference. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah. It's a lot of self-referential humor. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it continues like this. Like they play psychos one, two and three on all three screens. Yeah. Which makes and no then, sense to do that. <laughs> yeah. No. Which, which, one, why would you show Psycho 3 to begin with? <laughs> I, I mean, I like Psycho 3 just fine. Because it's not Psycho 4? <laughs> well, I mean, that is true. I'll give you that. Give... I mean, they're still better, though, than the remake, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but, no, uh, there's one scene in the hearse that I like where, like, uh, one of them's in the, like, they're in the back, and one of them, uh, pulls out a couple of beers and hands them through, like, the curtain. Oh, I like the banter between uh, Corey and Keith here. What about hot dogs, Keith? I got your hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> Corey, that's not very nice, Keith. Yeah, it is. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so yeah, they're showing a uh, Psycho 1, 2, and 3. Um, oh, uh, oh, now I got the scene here. In the hearse front seat, Brooke struggles up to, uh, snuggles up to Richie. Uh, I'll get him back, says Lonnie. Uh, Richie, no, we will. In a minute, over his shoulder, how about a couple of beers? Sound of a tussle in the back seat. Eventually, Keith's hand uh, rises to deliver two beers. Oh, God. That, that is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, and then there's, like, a joke about them, like, having a threesome, if I remember correctly. Or, or, there is. There yeah. is a joke about that. I don't yeah. remember where, but it's, like, just before, I believe, uh, before, I think it's Lonnie who leaves. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, like, just before then. All right, so anyway, uh, sorry for the interruption here, but uh, the, uh, we then uh, cut back to, like, the police trying to talk to uh, the Wallaces. Yeah. Yeah. The Wallace and the Doyles. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they, that's when they get reports of the deaths at the pumpkin patch and the stop and start over the radio. And Hunt goes like, well, I'm going to try and think like Michael Myers here. Well, his 
his other sister you know, is not around, so he's going to go and kill other teenagers. Where are the teenagers? The drive-in. Good thinking Stun- there, Hunt. <laughs> Stunning work there, detective. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And so Lindsay and Leah arrive at the drive-in, and they split up looking for Tommy. And Leah, she talks to to uh, Steve and a girl in tank top, whom she knows. And they're they're heading back from the snack bar, and they go like, "Nah, we haven't seen anybody." And then she keeps looking around. Then she comes to the truck that belongs to Steve, and then she finds that they're both dead inside yep. the car, not themselves. And then the shape pulls her into the car, and she dies off screen. And then we cut to uh, in the hearse, and Lonnie is dreaming about the time he had with his friends when he got scared off by Dr. Loomis, which is just like, you just fell asleep randomly, okay? <laughs> and then he wakes up and notices that Richie and Brooke are missing, and Fog is playing on the TV. Again, more self-referential humor. On the screen. Yeah. yeah, the Fog's on the screen, and he's like talking to Adrian Barbo. Which, keep in mind, at this point, uh, John Carpenter and Adrian Barbeau have, like, gotten a divorce. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just, just, just tell the lawyer to call you Billy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Lonnie gets out to go to the bathroom, has a hard time seeing anything outside. Because it's all covered in fog. <laughs> yeah. And then he, um, and then he notices that someone's following him. And then while he's in the, then while he's in the restroom, he's paranoid that someone is watching him, whatnot. This like continues for a little while, mm-hmm. and then Lonnie gets back to the hearse and then finally sees that everyone in in the hearse is dead. And then outside, he finds Leah's body and among like a bunch of other people like dead in the cars. Yeah, so I guess basically, my- uh, basically everybody in the cars is dead. People had a lot of time on his hands. How no one fucking noticed, I don't know, but yeah. But this I guess actually, it's, meant to be, it's I guess it's meant to be like a suspension of uh disbelief at this point that like Michael's so powerful he's able to get this killing done in a short amount of time. Right. And I can I can, I can buy it, honestly. Like it it's one of those things where it's just like everything else in the script I I can get it, you know. Yeah, it's a little more plausible in our draft due to how we handle Michael, but we'll get to that. Yeah. But, but the only the only thing I'm kind of questioning is why didn't Lindsay notice anything? That is true. Yeah. But, but anyway, um, but anyway, this actually leads to a really cool visual. It's when, uh, it's when, uh, Lonnie, when he's getting killed, he runs into the projector room and, and they're playing Friday the third, one of the, fr- they're playing one of the Friday the 13th movies and he sees Michael down below. Yeah. And, but he doesn't realize it's the killer. Yeah. And so he goes, Hey, come up here and help me. And then he runs down the stairs and around the side. But the, 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 the person he saw is gone. Then he hears footsteps going up to the projector room and he calls up, Hey, something's going on here. A shadow falls over. And it's, it just says Friday the 13th. It doesn't specify a sequel. So there's a, a bit of a fuck up here. I, I would the, just, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's just saying one of the Friday movies. I, I, if anything, I would expect it to be a uh, part six when, uh, Tommy Jarvis yells out to Jason and he turns around. Jason, you pussy. Yeah. Um, because of what they do, uh, with the scene where when Jason turns around on camera. Yeah, so basically what happens is that Jason, is that the, the shadow of the shape falls on the screen while Jason is turning towards camera and then the image burns out and then, and Lonnie looks up and he sees the shape standing there as yank the film out of the camera is crushing it in its hand and it cocks its head and he sees it's the two missing fingers grow back. Mm hmm. I love this really scene. Really cool. Yeah, really cool scene. The meta gag with Jason is a little much. Mm-hmm. I do love the visual, I, the visualization of it though, because it's like, because it's like shit like that. I always find cool, but it does kind of like lead. It does get a little on the nose. Like, hey, the real slasher's back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, we we get it, John. You don't like you don't like Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah, but anywho, um, then outside, and then uh, Lindsay eventually finds Lonnie killed by Michael, and then. Outside the drive-in at the entrance, uh, um, bracket orders cops all around. Finally, backup shows up. Yeah. And then, and then Mrs. Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace arrive. And, um, and then back in the drive-in, several boys led by, led by two, uh, from the van sneak in, sneak in wearing Michael's modified Captain Kirk mask. So essentially we have Michael and then we have fake Michaels. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, um, we got Buster Rhymes over here. Yeah, exactly. You're not my boy. I'm my boy. Get your ass out the back. Trick or treat, yeah. motherfucker. 
It's gonna be the most cynical <laughs> way from like middle aged men to seem young and hip, cruel to uh, teenagers ever. Yeah. <laughs> as cops enter, as Michael like chases Lindsay around the drive-in. And then, like, everyone's confused because it's like, wait, who's Michael? Because, you know, all the kids are roaming around. I'm still curious, why did these kids in Michael Myers masks decide to show up at the drive-in, like, at this convenient moment? I don't know. Well, I think they they were trying to prank and freak out the people in the cars. Yeah. They just happened to show up. I find it weird that they don't react to anything. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like. It's pretty obvious at this point now that they're all dead, so how the hell they don't notice it is beyond me. But anyway, I digress. But So the cops hold their fire as, uh, yeah, Robert Mundy arrives with uh, Dr. Mary, with Dr. Stern, and uh, she tries talking to Michael, and, and she grabs, she actually grabs Michael's attention, and then they have like their little, uh, uh, dialogue. I forget what where it is at on here. It's kind of like in Freddy's Revenge, where the guy's going like, "Hey, man, it's cool. Let us help you. Help right, let's say fucker." Yeah. Yeah. And then Michael been... pimps. Mike Michael pimp slaps her. Yeah. yeah, it gets to Lindsay, and then they then they cops just like run into action, and they start shooting shooting at Michael. They... Well, what happens is that. Is that he's still too close to Lindsay, and then Hunt runs over with his shotgun, blasts Michael with the shotgun, and Michael just, he's staggered a bit, and he gets back up from it, grabs the shotgun, snaps it in half, and then smashes Hunt's face in, and I guess he kills him. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if he snaps the shotgun in half in the actual Halloween 4 when Brady's trying to shoot him. I remember he he takes it and drops it over the railing, but oh well. I I wonder, in your rewrite, does he stab Hunt with the shotgun? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, like, an- and then Michael finally grabs Lindsay, and then Tommy shows up and shoots Michael, and like everyone's getting their hand at my at shooting Michael today. Yeah, and he actually blows part of his skull off. Yeah, and then at this point, I guess because I guess it's not they're not too close anymore. Like, just the cops just start opening fire on Michael Myers, and then. It just, this is where it gets weird. It just straight up but, becomes Angley's Hulk because Yeah, Michael, but when they're, they're, when they're filling him full of bullets, it's kind of like the ending of the actual Halloween. Yeah. yeah. But, like, the thing that makes it straight up, like, as they're shooting at him, Michael starts growing. He becomes upwards to 12 feet tall. It's just, like, <laughs> it's a straight up shit out of Angley's Hulk. And then, yeah. yeah. And, like... Yeah, like, no way would Cannon have been able to afford that. <laughs> yeah. Like, and so bullets start ricocheting, and then one, and then one of the bullets hits the car, hits a car, and then it explodes, and all the cards explode in a domino effect. They definitely wouldn't have been able to afford that. Yeah. yeah the whole place goes boosh in a big explosion. Um, for me, uh, the, the metaphor is kind of obvious with this, that like Michael's now so powerful that like whatever damage you're trying to inflict upon him, he just grows even bigger. The problem here for me is that it's just introduced at the last minute, and also having him turn into 12 feet tall, it doesn't feel like it's in a slasher movie anymore. Maybe that's the point, but I feel like it needed to be something that was more in keeping with the genre. Yeah, like, had they, like, set it up more that this is not the Michael Myers that, like, was, that that we knew from the first two movies, I felt like it could have worked, because, like, in the first two movies, like, I mean, Michael, yeah, he's a force of nature, but he's still sort of human at that point. Yeah. Like, like... If they had established early on that he's more a monster than man now at this point, I felt like it would have been fine, but it just, it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, maybe, um, maybe, maybe do, maybe do something a little bit smaller, like still have all the shots and the big explosion. And then when the smoke clears, he's just gone. Well, that's sort of what happens here. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't do the 12 foot tall. Oh, okay. Thing. Okay. Now I, don't, now. don't do super Michael. Yeah. Hulk, it's Michael. super Freddy. Michael oh. smash. But anyway, um, <laughs> Point, Bruce. But anyway, in the fire explosion, after the fire explosion, uh, the police and Mundy scatter out. How the hell they survived, I don't know. And the parents mm-hmm. can't find their children, believing they are all dead. And uh, Karen shoots the footage, and Tommy and Lindsay climb the hill. And in the background, in the background, and Mundy covers up the lens. So it's impl- So Mundy does see it, but he just doesn't say anything. I think. And Mundy, pointless. Yeah. And so they're climbing the hill, and Lindsay looks back, and she sees the smoke clears, and Michael is just gone again. Yeah. 
And so they end up, you know, it's the ne- and it cuts to the next morning. The two of them are they're they're basically they they basically have said they're just leaving Haddonfield behind completely. And the next morning they're sleeping in a barn, and we get a bit of a fake out where like the shadow of the shape is cast on the door, and then the door opens and it shines on Lindsay and she screams, but then she wakes up and it's just another dream. And then they show a, a quick shot of a pumpkin patch, and then it fades to black. And basically, all the themes don't really lead to much, don't. <laughs> Yeah. So are we implying with this ending that Haddonfield is just screwed permanently, and so the only way to get away from Michael is to just leave? I guess so, yeah. That's that's kind of the vibe I'm getting, but it's just like, it, that's the thing. Like, my biggest problem, like you said, Bruce, with the script is that, like, nothing is clear. Like, the themes are not clear. There's no arcs for anyone or, like, any kind of, like, s- story arc to go from. It just, like, shit just happens. Yeah, I think Edgerson realized, because uh, he said in an interview that it's not like a perfect script, but he was still proud of what he was writing. But I, I, I've said this before to you, Bruce, like, I feel like if yeah. uh, um, Dante was going to direct this, he should have given this to like a John Sales to do a rewrite of. He would have given it to somebody, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, somebody like, like John Sales would have done amazing with it. Yeah. Because it's like, I, like, I'll admit, like, I, there's problems in the script like it's nowhere near a perfect draft but the shit that does happen into it I feel like has a lot of potential and had this gotten made I felt like it would have been a I felt like it would have been a pretty worthy successor different but I felt like it could have worked they just had to have like changed uh, some stuff up and tightened the script and kind of made the scene a little bit more clear and maybe short like combine characters or just get rid of some characters completely all together and yeah and I guess uh, should we then uh, transition into our discussion about the rewrite? Might as well. I just, I just, I just wanted to sum up my thoughts on this script. Sure. I do think it, it it gets better for me with every reading. I mean, it is still you know flawed in a lot of ways. And one thing I will say though, as flawed as it is, it's still much, much, much better than those three we read last year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. Halloween Returns was just sort of there. It wasn't offensive, but like the other two were offensive to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, and like, I know a lot of people say this one is like, people say, oh, this is cheesy or way too over the top. But I felt like with how the series was going and especially after watching like Halloween 3 or stuff like that, it felt like a, it se- it feels like a natural progression, I feel yeah. like, like, tone and scale. Yeah. With so all the craziness I'm, that happens in 3, yeah, this is logical. Yeah, it, it seemed like a logical pro- progression. And I feel like... Yeah, like it's not perfect, but it could it could have worked, and I feel like it could have been a very worthy successor. Would it have had needed a big budget, absolutely, but yeah, I feel like if you had gotten the right talent behind it, you could have it could have worked. Well, my question here is: Was Carpenter really that invested in seeing the script get made? It doesn't don't, sound like it. I, I, you see, like, that's the thing. Like, Carpenter's always been kind of wish-washy when it comes to, like, his involvement with Halloween. It seems like he seems like to have... He likes to have more of, like, a backseat kind of, like, observer kind of view with uh, the franchise where he just kind of gives pointers and is just like, if it doesn't happen, whatever, doesn't matter, you know? So it's like, he didn't seem dedicated to make it happen. He just seemed more like he was there to give notes. Because I know, like, even with the production on the newest Halloween, he gave more notes and even then, like, he still wasn't that direct. Like, the only thing he directly was involved with was doing a score. Like, he did barely any executive producing. He did. Yeah, it was more ceremonial in that case than medical. Yeah, so I feel like it would have been... <laughs> yeah. Like for reference. Yeah. So I felt like it would have been very much the same case here, where I feel like Edgerson would have finished his, uh, would have finished, like, his draft, and then had Dante had decided to go forward with it, he would have brought in someone to rewrite it, and we would have eventually gotten something very close, but Carpenter would have been, probably would have had his name on it, like, just in name only, barely, like, that involved in production, I feel. You may have done the score with Alan Howarth again, but, I mean, it, I, I would like to talk to him about this, so. Yeah, because I'm, 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 yeah, but I have a feeling he didn't have much to do with it. It was just more like backseat involvement, like kind of giving pointers because he had worked with Edgerson in the past. I, I just imagine asking him the question, John, how, how, how invested in the script are you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and with that, with that, I guess we can talk about the rewrite now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, where do we begin with our rewrite? Well, uh, well, I mean, like my story began like, 
like we had we were talking about it like on and off for a, like a couple of months, I think. Yeah. And then like I didn't fully go into like wanting to do it until I think it was after I left school and I was kind of aching to kind of just test my screenwriting stuff, like my screenwriting uh, skills. And I and I asked you for a for a copy and I read the third draft. Which isn't that different. Like, there's just like mine. There's like little differences here and there. And yeah, it's mainly dialogue. dialogue changes that it makes. Yeah, honestly, like the third draft is less clear than the second. <laughs> I will yeah. say that. But um, but like we were talking and we thought we were just gonna go into it and just like do like a quick cleanup. That wound up not being the case at all because it's like the glaring the problems there were were kind were glaring and needed some work. Mainly being like clear clear themes clear arcs and less characters and then from there we started spitballing multiple different ideas and uh we've been we've been like working on this for about a year i think hasn't it been? yeah it's been over a year uh damn near two at this point i think yeah but it, it's just something that we have to put on the back burner do it to our own like daily lives and not yeah, yeah i know like I, like me, I come from more of like a director standpoint when it comes to writing. Like I just more like think of like what changes we could make that are minor, you know, and, and then I kind of go from there. We kind of like just collaborate that kind of way where it's like Christian will kind of spitball an idea and then I will kind of like think about it and we'll just kind of go on back and forth. And I know the main thing we mainly agreed on was that were we combining characters? Uh, perhaps. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've looked at our notes fully. Yeah. I know. Because I know, like, I, I, I know a big thing that was irritating me was Darcy Brooke and, uh, damn, I'm spacing on the third one's name. Uh, Corey. Corey, yeah. I, I know, I know that annoyed me. Um, she's the, she's the third Corey. Yeah. But it's like, and, but like, big dip, the big change was, uh, how we handled Michael because we were kind of going for a much more, uh, I don't want to say over the top, but much more uh, in tone with Dante's style and much more in uh, in a supernatural sense than what the script was really leading on. Yeah, with. or at the very least, more in keeping with the slasher tone. Exactly. Because I feel like the script is trying to go outside of the box, but doesn't know which direction outside of the box it wants to go in, per se. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, is it a monster movie? Is it a, like a ghost story? You know, and Maybe that was part of the point, but I feel like you still need to be clear about it. Um but the idea I, I settled on, and Bruce was like one of the first people I told to next to you, Alex, was like, what if Michael multiplied? It all started like thinking about the fingers, essentially, about them replicating. And um, I settled on a theme where like Michael has these fingers placed in like dead things yeah. or living to dead things. So the pumpkin patch would be an obvious location. Yeah. And then I reworked the... Um, bit at the Myers house to occur earlier in the script with Billy. So we have the script also taking place over the span of three days, kind of like the original My Bloody Valentine. Yeah, because like a lot of things that happened in the Etcherson script was just like, this cannot happen in one day. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, like on the first night, um, they go into the house and the you know dog bites off Michael's fingers. And then uh, Mr. Strode actually comes in and chases the kids away. And then uh, goes into the house to see if there's any damage and then uh, discovers Michael's fingers. And then Michael kills him off screen. I sort of have it written that, like, he throws the guy into the basement and then walks down to kill him. Yeah. Um, well, obviously he blows his head up with the electrical box. <laughs> <laughs> I then decided uh, to uh, have him be uh, something that's done at the, ho- at the high school where they discover his body as an effigy to Michael. I guess Michael uh-huh. creates his own effigy of him that says uh-huh. Lord of the Dead. Yeah. Oh. And then, I don't know if Michael would say that about himself, though. I was well, kind of okay with it because, like, even in the first two movies, Michael has always shown that he's been a much more theatrical killer. Yeah, you're right. Um, and he does lead people on wild goose chases intentionally. Yeah. The idea of Michael having that big of an ego is kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. I like that, then. Okay. And uh, he would have, like, painted the guy's face up to look, you know, like his mask at the end of Halloween 2 where there'd be. And uh, another motif I came up with was, like, a cat motif. Uh, we'll get into that um, in a little bit. But, um, yeah, he would um, – uh, and the guy's body would look like it was hollowed out, like something crawled out of it. Mm-hmm. And ah. um, so that would be then setting up this aspect. And then later we would see Michael popping up out of nowhere, you know, in the pumpkin patch. And you would question him why that is. 
and then um, into the third act or so, at, at the end of the second act or so, we then cut to uh, the alarm house where Billy and his parents are watching um, yeah, Old Yeller. And, yeah. and then the dog starts to panic, and we're getting near the end of Old Yeller as well. And it starts to writhe around in pain, and it goes into hiding, and we see like this shadow play of a Michael bursting out of the dog. That's, Michael's a xenomorph? Yeah, kind of, but like it's more of that like his uh when his finger is placed in a in an organism of some form, is that uh it will replicate itself it will create like a duplicate of Michael. And uh this is where I either have people say, Yeah, that's a good idea, or they'll say that's stupid. I know Arling hated it. I know Arling. Uh <laughs> I don't know if he'll listen to this, but yeah. Hi Arling. He hated more of the cat motif that I was going for because I had to think of, like, how does Michael get these fingers across town? And I thought, well, what if, like, he used, if there were, like, cats living in his house that sort of observe him as a master, uh, these stray cats. Um, and also with... And they, and the cats carry the fingers? Yeah. At least... Okay, now that's, that's just making me think of the lady killers. Yeah. But also with cats, if you're ever out at night, you'll see them wandering around outside houses and you don't really question why they're doing it. They're either stray cats or, you know, cats can go around, you know, exploring by themselves usually. Yeah. So you don't really think of anything of it. And there's also something kind of predatory about a cat, how they observe yeah. their prey, that I guess you could compare to Michael. Does this any <laughs> does any of what I'm saying make sense or did I do coke? Um somewhere in the middle. <laughs> okay. Uh he you he definitely he probably smelled grass, but <laughs> Yeah, I might have. Um and so yeah, that was um so it was fun to think of a way to create um Sort of a meta commentary on Michael duplicating, uh, about like the evil spreading, as you said, Alex. Yeah, because it's like the idea was that like the fear is like the fear of Michael Myers is spreading around the town, and there's like nothing really any of them is doing to stop, like nothing they can do really to stop. But I think was the idea. I yeah. think it's been so long since we talked about it. But then but. also there was the meta commentary of how does the slasher get from point A to point B in the movie? Right. And in this case, it's because there's a duplicate of him right around the corner. Yeah, and I thought that I like I like the idea of the multiplying thing because it's mainly because I like how it's like setting up like oh wait is it pe- is it people dressing up as Michael or is it just Michael Myers and I like how it's like well technically it's that one it's Michael Myers but yeah I, I just I just had a realization about the actual script did did all those kids in the Michael Myers masks just get blown up at the <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Collateral damage, right? Yeah. I'm trying to remember what else uh besides like the, the, the cat motif and the um and the didn't multiplying we, Michael. We didn't really get that far. We were mainly trying to figure out how to rework Michael first. Yeah, yeah, we're reworking the mechanics of the story first, I think. Yeah. Cause it's like because I feel like the like there's not much to change in terms of the story, it's just more trying to make things a little bit clearer. Well, make things clearer that then make it so that you change the story, essentially. Yeah. yeah. I know, like, the biggest change of the story is that we're cutting, that we cut the whole Monday thing because one, it's in the 2018 Halloween and two, it's exposition you don't need. Yeah. Could you, could you imagine if in this script at the last minute Stern turned out to be a bad guy? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She stabs Bracket. Yeah. Um, who puts on the mask? <laughs> yeah. Um, that was kind of offensive for me, seeing another character put on Michael's mask. I'm never really okay with that. Yeah, it, it's almost sacrilegious. It's almost... What was I going to say? Another idea that we came up with is that the mask is actually his face. Yeah, you mentioned that one to me. Yeah, that, like, um, you might have a scene where we might not spell it out, but essentially, like, a character might try ripping it off and they can't. It was, I, it was when Jennifer was, uh, it was during Jennifer's death. It was like yeah. she was trying to take it off, but like, like there's like no gap. Like it's just. Yeah, yeah, you try to put your fingers up through the, underneath the mask and it eventually just meets the skin. So yeah, implying that like, you know, he is that identity now, one and whole, essentially. Yeah. Well, I mean, now that he's a ghost or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and so I like that, I, I liked that idea. Um, yeah, I kind of liked, I, the the I, I will give the draft this. I like how Michael has much more of a ghost like premise like presence than he does a physical one. Sorry. I just feel like there's you can still keep him physically in the story and still keep the ghostly presence without doing the same goddamn fake out. <laughs> yeah, I wanted there to be a, a build up throughout the script of Michael uh, getting more and more dangerous. 
And we're not sure what we're doing with Mrs. Wallace's dream sequence uh, and whatnot. We might. Yeah, no, we keep going back and forth with that one because it's like it's such a tricky scene because it's like it's the it's an opening that I love, but Mrs. Wallace adds goddamn nothing to the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you described one of your possible rewrites of it to me, and that sounded really long. <laughs> what, yeah. What, yeah. What did I say? <laughs> I for, it's been so long I've forgotten, but it sounds sure. like it was very expansive. It's kind of one of those things where it's just like, it's like, you, you try to expand on this and it's just like, you either get too much, you try to like, take stuff out and it just becomes a muddled mess. And well, change then I, I, I also realized was that, uh, Bracket needed to be the human antagonist, uh, for law enforcement than Hunt. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, just because Michael killed his daughter, so that was way more, um, self-explanatory than, for whatever reason, Hunt now being insane. Um, yeah, Hunt and, Hunt and Halloween 2 is so chill throughout the whole thing. He's an asshole in the Halloween return script, but yeah. I know another change we were making was that uh, we were trying to lay in the theme of censorship and uh, yeah. anti-horror a lot more, just to make it a little bit more clear. Well, yeah, the Reagan, uh, the commentary about Reagan and whatnot, um, because I also decided, so with Bracket, I decided he needed to become like a right-wing Christian in between Halloween 2 and this and uh, I got the idea from when he says in Halloween 2, I need to go tell my wife before somebody else does. And I re- and I thought about what if uh, after the events of the first two movies, at some point, Mrs. Brackett killed herself because she couldn't deal with Annie being gone. And for whatever reason, it makes like Brackett turn towards this like evangelical or fundamentalist, whatever, uh, this like right wing form of Christianity. Turns out that's uh, exactly what they do to him at Halloween Kills. <laughs> uh, yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, it, it turns out the leader of his denomination is Reverend Sayer. Which reference are you making there? Because the name sounds familiar. He's the uh, he he he's the reverend. He's the drunken reverend that picks up Loomis and Hell. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember. God, I remember. evil always has a face in the name, and then he's randomly the man <laughs> in black in one of the Halloween Six scripts. I thought there was another. Like, anyone will remember that. Like, I thought there. Were, I thought they renamed that character to like Carpenter or something. They they rename the character, but they say it's supposed to be the same. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't, uh, we'll get to that script some other time, uh, Alex. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the VR. Oh, my yep, God. The v- yeah, and, oh, it's funny because they didn't like that script, so they went to another group of writers, but they still gave them the same notes of, yeah, uh, have VR in it. <laughs> Why? And, and also, it was also the origin of Hobo Myers. Oh, oh God. yeah. What is with the wine scenes and just hobos and executions? Oh, oh, but this got even weirder. This got, like, Rob Zombie Halloween 2-esque in one of them, where, like, uh, Michael's introduction, really, in the movie, outside of a dream sequence, his real introduction was you have these, like, frat guys at a party in Chicago, and they're dressed up as the droogs, and they're walking out, and they decide to actually be the droogs and just start beating up this homeless guy who turns out to be Michael. And, and in the one draft, you actually have him go to a homeless shelter. Yeah, it was that same draft. Okay, you know what? Fuck it. I don't give a shit what anyone says. I'm glad Blumhouse has fucking Michael Myers now. I mean, he, they probably would have gotten him anyway after the whole Weinstein shit, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. And, um, well, I mean, it was because Dimension lost the rights during Halloween Resur- uh, Returns production in, yeah. in 2015. Yeah, I think it's funny that as soon as the word came out that they had lost the rights to Halloween, all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, we're filming a new Hellraiser movie. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Let's not get started on Hellraiser. Oh yeah, there's also a Hellraiser reference in one of these Halloween Six scripts. Oh god, a very overt one as well. It's not subtle because uh, the Miramax owned the rights to both. I was gonna say another uh, change that we were possibly making is that the Stop and Start Market is now a video store. Yeah, and uh, they treat pornog they treat horror like pornography, where you have to go into the beaded section in the back. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, and uh, I might have a scene in there with uh, Billy who goes into the back and is looking at the tapes, and like he uh, is looking at like the S's and comes across George Romero's season of The Witch, and yeah. then uh, but then lands on Sleepaway Camp <laughs> and starts looking at it, and then uh, his mother pulls him out of the store. Oh my and, god, I forgot about that. Yeah. Oh my god, she's a boy. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we wanted to have uh, a little more references to the horror genre because also another commentary we're, we were making in this script, in that script is in there, in this universe, um, the events of Halloween 1 and 2 actually lead to the slasher genre existing. 
Because oh. then you get like all these like indie horror filmmakers like, yeah, there was odd case in Hattonfield where uh, that controversial thing that happened two years ago where they don't celebrate Halloween anymore, but uh, all because of this masked serial killer, nobody could explain. Let's make a movie that's somewhat about that, you know? Yeah, it's it's similar to that of like the uh, the inspired by a true story craze that was happening like in the late two thousands. <laughs> well, even in the seventies, but yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that that, that happened in the seventies. I just that's the most yeah. recent example I could think of. <laughs> but yeah, we wanted to add uh, so like the whole bit with Jason uh, meta ness adds a bit more weight to it because I'm actually sort of saying that like Michael creates the slasher genre in that universe. I don't know how the hell we'd be able to fit it all in one script, but it's like. It's still early in development because, like I said, we, we haven't been able to, like, really sit down and actually, like, actively rewrite it because it's, like, I've been doing my own thing. Christian's been doing his own thing. But it's, yeah. like, it's still early in development. If any of this shit gets made, I have no goddamn idea if it will. But we'll just have to wait it out. I'm 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 looking forward to actively rewriting it again because it's, like, I love the Halloween franchise and I love um, trying to dive deep into it. And I feel like this script, has a lot of potential. Like Edgerson did write a pretty decent script. It's flawed, sure, but like the the framework is there. It just needs to be worked upon. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And anyway, that's all I really gotta say. Yeah, that's all yeah, that's all uh, I have to say at this point. Yeah, me too. As far as I can know. I I might say uh, in the comments section what I missed. I won't remember a goddamn thing because it's like eh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I think that makes for a, um, a decent stopping point for the episode. Yeah. I'm sort of active on social media, but it's more personal stuff. I'm not really promoting myself at this point. Um, I'm, I will promote myself. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, my name is uh, at Alex Wykey, W-O-Y-T-C-K-E. Yeah, try, try spelling that correctly. Um, and um, you can follow me on there. Uh, I post stuff. I post just... Random stuff I'm doing, uh, film projects I'm working on, and uh, and then uh, you can follow my feature film uh, fin- uh, at, on Instagram as well at Finals Week Movie, and hopefully that should be done by summer next year. And I already promoted myself at the beginning, so fuck it, we're ending. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, yeah, guys, until next time, whatever the next episode ends up being, bye. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween.